A Simple Choice Amish Romance Secrets, Book One Written by Samantha Price Narrated by Susanna Coleman Chapter One Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 37, 5 I wish he wouldn't come to town. Kate gazed out the window across the dusty road to the only love she was sure she would ever know. Of course, it was sinful to covet something or indeed someone who wasn't hers, but in her heart he had been hers. It was he who had chosen to marry another. Look who's across the road. Rebecca, Kate's employer, nodded in the direction of Benjamin. Rebecca would have known Kate had already noticed him, as she spent most Tuesdays gazing out the window in the hope of seeing him walk past. Now don't go causing trouble. He means nothing to me, and he's married. Kate's voice was necessarily stern as Rebecca delighted in teasing her about men and getting married. I may be old, but I know love when I see it. Rebecca gave a chuckle and put her head down to continue sewing. Rebecca used to be Amish and had been like a mother to Kate ever since Kate had left the Amish some years ago. Kate could not deny she still missed Benjamin's company even after all this time. He was kind and gentle, and there was something about him that made Kate's heart beat much faster at the very thought of him. Kate's gaze was drawn back to him. Benjamin was speaking with an Englisher, and it looked like they knew each other quite well. Not much about him had changed since the day Kate had left the Amish. He looked exactly as she remembered him from back then in his straw hat, the billowy white shirt, and the black pants held up by the black suspenders. The only difference was in his face, which was now covered by a beard, which enhanced the strength of his jawline. She hadn't seen his face up close lately, but studying it from afar, she was certain there would have been fine lines in his forehead and at the corners of his eyes. Would it hurt to say hello to him? Rebecca asked. Benjamin is taken now, married to another. You shouldn't talk of such things. It would be a sin if I thought such things. Kate added, It says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Just asking, Rebecca replied. Kate sighed, knowing that it was far too late and nothing could possibly be done about Benjamin being married. She would have to face the fact that Benjamin would never be her beloved. The only small comfort Kate took was in the thought that Lydia, his wife, must be a wonderful woman, or Benjamin wouldn't have chosen her. Kate and Lydia were around the same age, but had never been friends growing up. Kate put it down to their personalities being so different. Although Kate had not formally left the Amish community, as she hadn't had the baptism, she knew she wouldn't return as she'd left it behind in her heart. She still kept to her Christian ways and still read the scriptures every evening, as was the way of her family. You seem to remember that scripture very well, by heart. Rebecca suppressed a smile and stared at the pants she was sewing. Kate looked across the large wooden table at her employer. I do, I've had to memorize it, Kate replied. Rebecca's face was now pinched into a frown and two deep lines furrowed between her eyebrows. Kate wondered if it would have been wiser if she hadn't told Rebecca about her private pain. Rebecca's right. I've had to remember that scripture just to get by. Kate tried unsuccessfully to occupy her mind with the work in front of her. Her duties weren't hard, and mostly Kate enjoyed the repairs they took in and the custom dressmaking jobs such as wedding dresses. The beautiful, small pearl beads that Kate was applying to the bodice of the wedding dress in front of her jolted her thoughts back to Benjamin. I wonder if he knows I work in this little tailor shop. He's never once called to see me. Why would he come to see me, though? It was my choice to leave. And besides, he has to abide by the rules. Since I left, he's not supposed to speak with me. Besides that, he's a married man. Kate looked through the tailor shop window to see that Benjamin had just finished his conversation with the Englisher and was walking away. With every step he took away from her, the pain in her heart grew. Her eyes fixed themselves upon his large, steady frame until he disappeared from sight. The ache in her heart was just as fierce as the day she'd heard that he was betrothed to another. However, that did nothing to dull the image of his warm smile that was etched deeply into her heart. She could still hear the comforting, mellow tones of his voice dancing in her ears. Kate sighed heavily as she reminisced of the simple days of her youth when she played in the green fields with her sisters and baby brother. The gentle sun smiled upon their skin as the gentle breeze caressed their cheeks. Every evening, 
the smell of their mother's cooking drew them in from their play. Everyone had chores on the farm, yet they never considered the chores as work, because they were accompanied by family togetherness and laughter. After they finished their duties, there was always time to play. Benjamin was often included in their games. Benjamin's farm, next door, often had baby animals they would play with and help look after. She remembered how Benjamin and his brother Jesse came to dinner with her family, at least once a week. That was until he married Lydia. Kate smiled as she recalled how she followed Benjamin around talking to him, even though he was older than she, and he probably thought of her as just a mere child. Surely Benjamin would have felt the same attachment as I did. The pull toward him was so strong that he must have felt the same too. Before long, her mind drifted to the summer day when the 19-year-old Benjamin told the then 14-year-old Kate that he would marry her when she grew up. That day had been the happiest day of her life. She couldn't remember the exact words that he had spoken, but she had always remembered the intent. Even though she was young, she knew to take someone at their word. Kate was devastated when Benjamin suddenly married Lydia just four short years later. Lydia was only a year older than Kate, and Kate always wondered why he had chosen Lydia over her. Sometimes Kate thought about it so much that it made her headache, and even then she was still no closer to finding an answer that made sense. Kate tried to return her attention to the sewing in front of her. How stupid she'd felt when she realized that he hadn't really meant his careless words as a promise. Benjamin would never go back on his word. He must have seen me as a silly child. He was just having a joke. The color rose in Kate's cheeks as she recalled the pain and humiliation of Benjamin's rejection. She had come to realize that he being 19 and a grown man had thought nothing of the comment of marriage to a 14-year-old child. It had been a remark in passing or a joke. Kate was the only one who had taken it as a solemn promise. You'll get over it, Rebecca said comfortingly, as if reading Kate's mind. Time heals all wounds. Kate raised an eyebrow in response to the comment. She knew it was something that she would not get over. Not ever. It wasn't like a cold that she could just recover from and slowly mend. There was no cure for what ailed her, no medicine, no half glass of medicinal wine, and even time hadn't healed her. To Kate, Benjamin was a part of her, a part of her very soul. I know that you still think about him a lot, Rebecca said. Kate bit her lip kept her head down and tried to give her utmost attention to the small pearls she was sewing into an intricate pattern. Rebecca and Kate's friend Liz were the only people Kate had ever told of the pain of losing the only man she would ever love. He was the only man she wanted to have children with. She had always wanted a large family with Benjamin as her husband. All had been perfect in Kate's world until that dreadful day she heard the terrible news of Benjamin's impending marriage. Prior to that, Kate could not recall ever having a day with sadness or sorrow. Now all her days seemed that way, as though there was a gray cloud over her head that followed her wherever she went. Kate dare not tell anyone other than her two closest friends, because it was wrong for her to desire the husband of another woman. On the day Benjamin married Lydia, Kate swore she would leave the Amish as soon as she was able. Kate's father made her wait another whole year for her rumspringa. That year she'd been forced to stay, Knowing Benjamin was on the farm next door with his new wife was the longest, most painful year of her life. Kate wanted to be happy for them, but she could not. Kate was desperate to get away from the community before she would have to see Lydia and Benjamin blessed with a baby. A year later, Kate's father relented, and Kate was finally allowed her rumspringa and she made her escape. Chapter 2 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2. Timothy 2.15 Yet escape was only possible in the physical sense. The mental images of Benjamin being happy with another woman played on her mind. Even though she was no longer on the farm next door, she may just as well have been. Kate realized there was no escape from her dark, unhappy thoughts. She had prayed to God to take the longing for this man away. Kate was sure God hid from her sometimes, because he had not answered her prayers. Can't he see and feel the pain I'm going through? The scripture in Isaiah came into Kate's mind, where Isaiah had said that God was hiding from him. He's hiding from me too, she thought. Rebecca's words interrupted Kate's thoughts again, and brought her back to the present moment. It's time you started thinking of your future. Kate knew that Rebecca meant well, 
but she did not want to hear again how she should meet a nice Englisher and settle down. Besides that, she had only just turned 20, and that was young for an English person to get married. Kate hoped that in time everything would fall into place for her, and God would finally answer her prayers and stop hiding from her. She so longed to have peace in her heart once more. I'm happy doing what I am doing now, working here with you. Well, it's partly true, Kate thought. Kate did love working with Rebecca, and sewing was the thing she was best at. She had quickly learned to use the industrial sewing machines required for the various kinds of sewing activities assigned to her. Kate enjoyed the hand beating, which she did on the majority of the wedding dresses that they made. In fact, her favorite thing would have been to sew the pretty and glamorous wedding dresses that she was sewing now. If only wedding dresses didn't remind her of Benjamin. Amish wedding dresses were nothing like the wedding dresses of the English. Amish wedding dresses were always plain and never showed off the body, as did the dress on which Kate was now working. It had a tightly fitted bodice with ribbing to pull the waist in tight. There was also false padding in the upper region designed to push the breasts up and out. Kate smiled as she thought of an Amish woman attending her wedding dressed in one of these English wedding dresses. She suppressed a giggle imagining the shocked expressions that would be on all the guests' faces. It was something that would just never happen. An Amish woman would never show off her body, as modesty was what they were known for. Pride or vanity was not a thing that the Amish considered to be a valued trait. Neither were they concerned with their appearance on the outside, not wearing makeup or fancy hairstyles. It was the inside that they were concerned with. Kate recalled the scripture that says women should be adorned in respectable apparel, with modesty, and not adorned with costly jewelry or costly clothes. What about children, then? Rebecca stopped her sewing machine and looked across the workstation at Kate. Kate felt a sharp pain in her heart. To be blessed with children to love and to care for was the thing that she had always longed for, but she wanted to have them with someone she was in love with. Not only was she deprived of the one man she wanted, she was also deprived of having children with that same man. Kate knew the benefits of growing up in a happy house filled with the laughter of children. Keeping a home and looking after her husband and children was the best thing Kate could hope for in life. Besides Benjamin, it was the only thing that she wanted. Although a lot of Amish folk got married early, she was by no means old. She was barely in her twenties. Kate was sure women in their late thirties were still able to conceive fairly easily. Why is Rebecca putting these things into my mind? Rebecca, I'm still only young. I hardly have to worry about not being able to have children, do I? Rebecca said. I suppose not. But you should at least have some sort of a plan. You can't go on drifting. You're a youngster now, but if you don't make some plans or have some direction in your life, you'll wake up one day and you'll be 30. She's most likely right, as usual, Kate thought. All right, I'll try and come up with some sort of a plan for my life. Kate looked over at Rebecca. Happy, she asked. Yeah, I'm glad. Just don't want to see you waste your life pining away on some lost love that was never meant to be. Rebecca's words were like a knife stabbing through Kate's heart. Deep down, Kate knew that Rebecca wanted the best for her, but her straightforward approach was a little too blunt sometimes. The words never meant to be lingered in Kate's ears. Kate was sure that it was meant to be. She was convinced that they were meant to be together. Until, of course, she'd heard the dreadful words that Benjamin was to be married to Lydia. She couldn't even remember who had told her or how she'd found out. All she knew was that she had felt that she had been run over by a truck, and that feeling had stayed with her. Kate found it hard to get the image of Benjamin's face out of her mind. She recalled the day that she found herself alone with Benjamin in the field when she was younger. He asked her for a kiss, and she had refused him, as she wanted to wait for their wedding day. Now Kate regretted that decision. Now she would never know the taste of his lips. Now she would never feel the gentle caress of his lips against hers. Rebecca left the shop to go to the small lady's room just outside the back of the shop. Kate took the opportunity to close her eyes and think back to the day that Benjamin wanted that kiss. She imagined that she had said yes. He lowered his soft lips to hers and lingered for just a moment, and she felt the gentle breath escape from his slightly open mouth as it brushed over her parted, waiting lips. She breathed in his familiar scent of hay and manliness as he gently placed his beautiful lips to hers. Shivers shot down her spine as Kate imagined the feel of his warm, moist mouth against hers. Kate's heart raced and she pulled her mind back to the present moment as she realized that in her active imagination, she actively desired the husband of another woman. 
yet she had been powerless to stop. She regretted that decision to deny him that kiss. Would he have still married Lydia if I had given him my first kiss? She realized that is something that she would never know. Maybe that would have sealed their fate. If I had kissed him, he may have felt a commitment to me. Yet he said we would be married, and I thought that he meant it. That first kiss had been saved for Benjamin. But now for the first time Kate wondered if she could possibly marry someone other than Benjamin. Kate had never even considered a life as a spinster. She did not relish being one of those sad old ladies in the community who had to live with their aging parents or with other relatives and never have a home or children of their own. A life without children was not a life that Kate wanted. She wanted to have lots of children and a home with a beautiful garden that she could fill with colored blooms. She wanted to be able to cook all her husband's favorite meals and special sweets for him. She knew that all her children would be well-behaved and a help to their parents. But could she really marry someone else? Could she possibly fall in love with another man? Does true love come twice in one's lifetime? She thought about her boss, Rebecca. She had been very much in love with Colin, and after he died, she had never married anyone else, not even been on a date with a man. Rebecca walked through the back door of the shop into the workroom. Rebecca, do you think everyone is in love before they get married? Rebecca sat down at the little desk at the side of the shop where she tended to the bookwork. I believe some marry for love, but not all. I wouldn't marry someone who I was not in love with. I would have stayed in the Amish community if Colin had been Amish. Why didn't he convert then? As soon as she spoke the words, Kate regretted them. That was none of her business, and Kate had always been careful not to pry too much into Rebecca's past. The bits and pieces she knew of Rebecca's life were small pieces of information that Rebecca had shared over the past four years. Tears welled up in Rebecca's eyes at the mention of her late husband, Colin. Kate saw her pain and hoped that she would be able to have a love that strong with her own husband someday. Kate had never met Colin. Rebecca's love for him had caused her to leave the Amish 20 years ago. He had died just months before Kate had knocked on the door of the tailor shop looking for employment. Kate did not know how old Rebecca was exactly. She figured she was around 40. Kate recalled that Rebecca had told her she had married when she was 18 and been married for 20 years. He didn't believe in their ways. He was not someone who could live with rules and regulations. He didn't believe in God, Rebecca said. Kate could not suppress the shocked look on her face, but managed to stifle a gasp that nearly escaped from the back region of her throat. She could not comprehend the thought of someone who did not believe in God. She knew that most Englishers did believe in God, even if they did not follow his ways. If they don't believe in God, they mostly believe in some sort of higher power, Kate thought. Didn't believe in God at all? Kate asked. The concept of this was unreasonable to Kate. Everyone had to believe in God. Who ordered the seasons, or made the human body in all its wonder? What about the beauty in nature? Surely Colin wouldn't have thought it all to be a coincidence, Kate said. Kate wondered where Colin would be now if he didn't believe. The thought filled Kate with sorrow. Well, when we first got married, he didn't believe in God. It didn't matter to me because I loved the man who he was. In the end, he came to believe he changed his mind. Kate smiled. I'm glad. Rebecca said, He never would have become Amish, though. Not in a million years. Kate nodded as she knew that it wasn't the lifestyle for everyone, and it was perfectly reasonable for everyone to choose to believe whatever they wished. Kate wondered whether Colin appreciated the fact that Rebecca made a huge sacrifice for him. She really wanted to ask Rebecca more, but did not like to pry in case it made her cry more. If Rebecca wanted her to know, she would tell her. That night, Kate dismissed all thoughts of Benjamin and prayed, God, please take this pain away. Kate comforted herself with the knowledge that God had a plan for her life. Kate remembered the words of Solomon from Ecclesiastes, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Kate figured her time had not yet come, and that the purpose of her life would soon unfold. Kate had been brought up to believe that her purpose was to get married, keep a good home, and be a help to her husband. With Benjamin married, God must have an alternate plan for her life that must involve being married to another man. Kate finished her prayer with these words, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do. That was the first time that Kate completely surrendered herself to God's will. She knew that with that prayer she might have to open her heart to another man. Kate snuggled in bed under her warm quilt with her head on the soft, downy pillow. 
Her mind drifted to the day she left home. Her dad gave her a little money, and she had a suitcase, which contained a couple of changes of clothing and a few small possessions. The only thing Kate could think of doing for employment was sewing, as that was the only thing that she could do well. A taxi had taken her into the small town near her home. Kate decided to go into every shop to see if they required staff. Kate would have done anything that she could find, but luckily before too long she spied the little tailor's shop. When she walked through the door and saw Rebecca's face, she had an uncanny feeling that she was home. Rebecca had given her a job immediately, pleased to have an Amish person working for her, as she knew that the Amish were hard and diligent workers. Kate had brought samples of her sewing, which also had reinforced Rebecca's decision to employ her immediately. There was a little apartment above the tailor's shop, where Rebecca kindly let Kate live for a very small amount of money. Kate had taken the job in the apartment for granted. She hadn't fully appreciated it at the time, but now she knew she would have been in a mighty fix if she hadn't gotten a job within those first few days. She may have had to go home after that, as she only had enough money to stay one week at the local hotel. Maybe God was watching over me after all, and had arranged this job and this place to stay. Ever since Benjamin had gotten married, Kate had questioned her faith, and she had often felt like God had deserted her. Kate, half asleep, looked around her small apartment in appreciation. The apartment was now dimly lit from a streetlight outside one of the two windows in the apartment. The other window was at the rear of the apartment and had a pretty view of the countryside in the distance. It was in the small apartment that Kate spent her nights quilting and longing for a love that could never be. Kate found that quilting was the only thing that truly soothed her and made her feel serene. Mostly it reminded her of home. A tear escaped her eye and trickled down Kate's cheek. She missed her two sisters, her little brother, her mother and father. She also missed the large house she grew up in, the horses and the farm, and even the wide open fields. Kate recalled the days of helping her dad on the farm with her older sister, Annie. Jacob had always tried to help, but he was still too small to be too much help. Kate's younger sister much preferred to stay and work in the house as well as tend the chickens and the vegetables. Peace and calm filled Kate as she reminisced how perfectly her family had worked together. Usually Kate's thoughts of her childhood always came with thoughts of Benjamin. But tonight, Kate managed to keep thoughts of Benjamin out of her mind. A week to the day later, Kate was at work sewing and looked out the window in the hope that Benjamin may go by. Just as she looked up, she caught a glimpse of a gray buggy, which her heart told her was Benjamin's. She remembered many times being in Benjamin's buggy with her sisters when they would go to horse auctions or barn raisings together. All Amish buggies looked the same, but there was something familiar about this buggy and the clip-clopping rhythm of the horse's hooves. Minutes later, Kate's heart froze when she saw Benjamin cross the road toward her and walk directly to the door of the little tailor's store. Kate could not think of any reason he'd have to come to the little store. He walked straight through the door just two seconds later. What is he doing here? It's been years and he has said nothing to me. What could he possibly have to say to me now? Kate swallowed hard when she thought that he might not even know she worked there. Maybe he has come for an entirely different reason. Chapter 3 Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Proverbs 16, 3 Thankfully, Kate's chair was not positioned facing the door, so she was able to keep her head down and keep sewing. She was too afraid to look up. She thought it best to pretend that she had not seen him. What would she possibly say to this man who she had been in love with as long as she could remember? What could he possibly say to her now that he was married to someone else? Kate's stomach churned into one big knot. She was able to breathe a sigh of relief when Rebecca left her machine to attend to the handsome Benjamin who was standing at the front desk. Rebecca had never met Benjamin, but knew who he was straight away. He was the man who Kate's eyes were transfixed upon every Tuesday when he came into town. Kate hadn't needed much encouragement from Rebecca before she told her the whole story. The story was that Benjamin had made a comment to Kate about being his wife, and then some years later she found out he was courting another woman. The courtship had been practically non-existent, and they had gotten married very quickly. Rebecca was very protective toward Kate. Kate was the daughter she had always wanted and was never able to have. She hoped that Benjamin would not hurt her further by coming here. He had a wife who could sew as all Amish women could. So what business did he have in coming here, Rebecca thought. 
Kate kept her eyes on her sewing in an effort to avoid making eye contact. She picked up a pearl and tried to thread it onto her needle, but this particular pearl did not want to cooperate, and Kate found her fingers fumbling. It had been years since she had spoken to Benjamin. Surely it would be best to pay him no mind. Her thoughts did nothing to stop the heat rising in her cheeks or her stomach from flip-flopping into knots. Before Benjamin spoke to Rebecca, his eyes were drawn to Kate at the back of the shop. Hello, Katie Miller, he said. Benjamin was the only one who called her by the name, Katie. Kate's heart always melted when he called her Katie. The mellow tone of his voice was music to her ears and made her heart pound. A glow rushed through her body in spite of herself. Kate couldn't pretend not to see him any longer. She looked up and responded in the most cheerful way she could muster. Ah, hello, Benjamin. I didn't see it was you. Kate immediately berated herself for telling the lie that had suddenly escaped from her lips. The needle and pearl that Kate had been wrestling with dropped from her hands and landed on the floor. Kate knelt to the floor to find the wretched pearl and retrieve the needle. Usually it was easy to see things that dropped on the floor, but for some reason they looked like they had completely disappeared. Benjamin turned to Rebecca. Morning, ma'am. I've come to talk to Kate if I could. Kate knew that Benjamin would not know that Rebecca had been Amish, since he would have been very young when she had left the community. Yet from Rebecca's plain clothes, he may have been able to guess that she was not really English. Without responding to Benjamin's greeting, she turned toward Kate. Kate, you have a visitor. Rebecca spoke in a formal tone as if she did not have the slightest bit of interest in why this stranger had come to speak with Kate. Kate knew that, in fact, Rebecca would be most interested in why Benjamin had come to see her. Kate also knew that for the rest of the afternoon the conversation would revolve around Benjamin. The knots in Kate's stomach were overtaken by the pounding of her racing heart. She could barely breathe. Abandoning her mission of locating the pearl and the needle, she stood up, steadied her nerves, put her best brave face on and walked toward him. Kate was at once confronted with the reality of how tall and manly he was. His skin was a little darker than she remembered, and he had faint creases in the corners of his deep hazel eyes. His smile was just as kind, which Kate knew reflected the kindness of his gentle heart. Benjamin took off his straw hat and placed it on the glass counter, which stood between himself and Kate. Kate was transfixed before him and did not utter a word. Benjamin smiled. You look just the same, Katie. You haven't changed one little bit. Kate could feel her cheeks burning as she lowered her eyes to the floor. She searched for words to formulate into some sort of a response. Yet all words abandoned her mind. Katie, I wonder if you might come back to see your parents, he said. Kate caught her breath and immediately was ashamed of herself. When she had seen him walk toward the shop, she had not stopped to think that one of her parents or siblings may be unwell. A pain went through her heart at the thought of one of them being in ill health. Are they well? she asked. They're well. They're sad that you left and would very much like to see you. They would like to speak with you. It's been a long time for them, he replied. Kate put her hand to her chest in an effort to calm her racing heart. Katie, it's been years since you've seen them, he told her. Kate wondered if his hesitation meant that he was going to say since she'd seen him. She knew that he would never say that, though, and he probably wouldn't think it either. Benjamin, you scared me for a moment. I thought that one of my family might be ill, she said. Benjamin smiled widely to reveal his perfect white teeth. No, they are all well. I didn't mean to cause you concern, he replied. What was it about this man? What was it about him that she felt she wanted him near her all the time? Why did she feel at peace and at home in his presence? Kate thought about her parents. She knew they were very unhappy with her choice to leave the community. Even though she was technically still on Rumspringa, she knew her parents desperately wanted her to come back home for good. She also knew that her parents thought that four years was long enough for a Rumspringa, and a decision would have to be made whether she would stay and live amongst the English, or make the decision to return to the Amish community and be baptized. Even though she had not seen them for four long years, the bond with her family was still there in her heart and she hoped it was the same for them. Did they still feel the same toward her? She hadn't seen them for years, so how could she know how they were thinking and feeling? Kate took a deep breath and realized that she was getting ahead of herself by thinking the worst. Her thoughts turned to how Benjamin knew she worked there, and for how long had he known. For four years, 
She had seen him every Tuesday in the street outside the store. Has he known I've been here for four years? She thought. She couldn't keep silent. She had to know. How did you know I worked here? She asked. Benjamin stepped back slightly and reached out his large, strong hand to pick up his hat. I've known for a while. His tone was unemotional and matter-of-fact. He gave no further information, so Kate did not know how long he knew she had worked there. Kate's mind drifted to every Tuesday when she would stare at him through the store window. He never once glanced in her direction. She wondered if he could feel her eyes upon him. Kate remembered that Benjamin often used to run errands for her parents, and she realized that even though he was married, he still must have a close relationship with her family. You shouldn't be talking to me, she said. You haven't left, have you? He asked. You're still on Rumspringa. Yeah. It was true, Kate thought. She was on Rumspringa. But at some point, Kate knew she would have to tell her parents she wasn't coming back. Kate wondered if Benjamin would think she was doing English things on her Rumspringa. She desperately wanted to tell him she was adhering to the Amish ways and did not desire the English ways at all. What Benjamin thought of her was still important to her. She thought he might be able to guess that she wasn't trying to be English at all, as she still wore the plain Amish clothing that hid her curvy figure. Gone was the prayer cap, but in its place was a modest scarf, which helped to keep her long hair in place. Kate had never even cut her hair when she left the community. It was still long and she always wore it piled on top of her head, secured with pins before putting the scarf in place. Kate silently reprimanded herself. She should not be concerned any longer with what Benjamin thought of her. He was no longer a potential husband. He was just a neighbor and friend of the family, nothing more. Kate noticed that Benjamin's eyes flickered quickly at the clothes she wore and then settled back on her face. Go and visit your parents. No one else need know, he said. Kate put her hand to the scarf on her forehead as it felt a little loose. I will visit them soon. Thank you for coming to see me, Benjamin, she replied. Benjamin smiled down at her and then nodded to Rebecca at the back of the room. He left just as abruptly as he had arrived. Kate tried to imprint his face onto her mind. This was a different face to the one she had remembered. Often when she was thinking about Benjamin, she would forget what he looked like which she considered quite strange as she saw him nearly every day while she was growing up. Now, she had a slightly different face to remember. A slightly older face, yet one that was just as kind. Kate turned to Rebecca. Both women stood in silence for quite a few seconds longer. Rebecca had been busying herself at the back of the shop to give them as much privacy as she could, but Kate knew that she was still listening to their conversation. Kate sat back at the large, old wooden sewing table that they shared. Rebecca walked over and patted Kate on her shoulder. I will put some coffee on. That would be good, thank you. Make it strong, please. Kate was glad that she was sitting down as her legs had gone weak. She knew they would not have the strength to hold her upright. She was grateful for a few moments to gather her thoughts while Rebecca made the coffee. She knew as soon as Rebecca got back, she would be hit with 101 questions, and she had no answers. Kate tried to busy herself with work. She recalled that she was trying to find a needle and pearl, which had fallen to the floor. As soon as her eyes fell to the floor, she spied the pesky little pearl on the floor. The pearl was lying next to the needle that she had dropped only moments before. Kate picked the pearl up and held it up to the light to examine it. The hole had not been drilled properly. No wonder she couldn't get it to thread properly on the needle. Kate wondered whether she was somehow like the pearl that wasn't drilled properly. The pearl had looked the same as all the other pearls, but it didn't work the same as the other pearls. It wasn't quite right. Was that why Benjamin passed me by? I wasn't quite right in some way? Kate tossed the pearl into the small plastic waste bin under the table by her feet, while recalling how handsome Benjamin looked. The four years had made him even more handsome, a little more rugged, yet more handsome indeed. He looked bigger and more muscled, which prompted Kate to wonder if Jesse was still helping him on the farm, or was he left to do all the farm work himself? It suddenly struck Kate that she should have asked after his family. She should have asked after Lydia and Jesse. Kate considered herself to be a very selfish girl. She'd let this crush on Benjamin take over her whole life to the point where she had forgotten the simplest of manners. She would have to get the thoughts of Benjamin out of her head. That was one thing that she knew she had to do. But how? Would attention from another man take her mind off Benjamin, perhaps? 
she knew that keeping busy was doing nothing to help. After work, if Kate wasn't taking a walk in the fresh air, she was always sewing in her apartment while the television was on in the background for noise. So she knew that keeping busy was not the way to divert her attention from Benjamin. It had been four years, and what she'd been doing up until now had not worked. It was obvious to Kate she had to alter her life in some major way to break the patterns of the past, so she could create a new life for herself. This new life had to be one where Benjamin was not the focus of all her thoughts. I should go back and see my family. Yeah, that is what I will do. Seeing my family may give me some clue what to do with myself. Chapter 4 And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 6, 5 Kate bit her lip. Is going home God's plan for me? She had just prayed the night before and told God that she would do anything that he wanted her to do if it would fulfill his purpose for her life. Now she knew she would have to keep her end of the bargain. Must be that God has someone else for me in the Amish community. But who could it be? She thought. Kate knew that since she wasn't able to marry Benjamin, then her husband must be somewhere in the Amish community. For she now realized that she could not even comprehend living the English lifestyle. Kate was sure that she knew everyone in the community and could not think of anyone who would be in the least bit suitable. There was Jesse who was suitable for Annie, and there were a couple of men that would be suitable for Sarah, but Kate kept trying to think of any man who would be suitable for herself, besides Benjamin. Perhaps Ephraim? Rebecca put a cup of hot coffee in front of Kate and sat opposite her, placing her own coffee down. You going back to visit your family? Kate nodded her head slowly. Rebecca took a careful sip of her steaming hot coffee. Now don't you go getting trapped back there if that's not what you want, Rebecca said. Kate stared into the dark reflecting pool, which was the coffee in the white mug in front of her. No, I won't. Thank you for the coffee. Kate was almost too scared to drink the coffee and was careful not to spill it on the crisp white satin wedding gown in front of her. Kate knew it would be a disaster to get even one tiny droplet of coffee on this dress. It was most out of character for Rebecca to let drink or food anywhere near white fabric at any time. It's just a visit, Kate said. Rebecca's eyes were fixed sternly on Kate. Why do you think he came here himself? Why didn't one of your sisters or your dad come to speak with you? The tone in Rebecca's voice was one of annoyance. It was clear to Kate that Rebecca was being protective of her and didn't want her to suffer any further hurt. Kate was appreciative of such a good friend since she was living away from home. Does Rebecca think that Benjamin had some sort of ulterior motive? She's too suspicious, probably from living with the English for too long. I don't know. I know that Dad won't come to town. Looks like Benjamin still does a lot of things for him and Dad must still help him too, just like the old days. Kate recalled the bond between her father and Benjamin. Benjamin's family owned the farm next to theirs, and his parents had died in a buggy accident when he was a young teenager. Benjamin ran the farm by himself until his younger brother was old enough to help him. Kate remembered her own father helping Benjamin on his farm, and now Kate's father was getting older. Benjamin was now helping him. Soon, Kate's younger brother Jacob would be old enough to do a man's share of the work. Kate made up her mind to visit her family the following Saturday. Kate wondered how she'd feel seeing all her family again. She hadn't felt guilty leaving her family because her two sisters were close in age. Both were a good help in the house to their mother. Kate missed them all and wondered if she may be tempted to stay. She knew her father would ask if she had finished with her rumspringa and was ready to come home and be baptized. Kate took a taxi the few miles up the road to her old family house. Although it was just a few miles, it could have been a million miles away. Out of respect for her parents, Kate wore the plainest clothes she had and even wore a prayer cap for her visit. The prayer cap would also help her to blend in, just in case someone was to see her. Kate still believed and followed the Amish ways because they were part of who she was. The taxi pulled up outside the house. She knew her younger brother would be out playing somewhere, and her two sisters would be at home helping their mother with the chores. Kate paid the taxi driver and stood back looking at her house. The house was white with a gray slate roof and consisted of two stories. The second level had been built when God had blessed the family with young Jacob. An extra extension was put on the side to allow for a larger kitchen living area. Everything was just as it was the day she left with the exception of even more colorful blooms in the garden, which she knew was due to her younger sister Sarah's handiwork. 
As always, the grass around the house was short and neatly trimmed. Kate's attention was drawn to two sparrows overhead that were chirping and chasing each other in one of the large trees near the house. Kate took a deep breath of the air, which she was sure was much nicer than the air she breathed in town even though it was just a few miles away. Everything seemed better and brighter. It wasn't only the air. Even the sun on her skin seemed to have a more welcoming feel to it. Kate suddenly saw the outline of her mother coming through the front door. Kate! Mom! Kate ran to her mother and hugged her. Kate's mother held her out at arm's length and looked her up and down before pulling her toward herself for another welcoming hug. Come into the house. Kate noticed that her mother's face was slightly more lined, and she was also a little softer and plumper around the middle. She'd been a good mother. She would stand for no nonsense from her children, and she always made time for each one of them in a kind and loving manner. Kate's mother had been like a second mother to many of the children Kate had grown up with, such as her best friend Liz, and also Benjamin and Jesse from the farm next door. Kate's mother and father had become like Benjamin and Jesse's parents since the buggy accident that took the lives of their own parents. Kate guessed that Benjamin would have been just 13 at the time, and being two years younger, Jesse would have been 11. Both boys stayed living with their grandfather in the house next door, but he died three years later. If and when Kate was lucky enough to have children, she decided she would try to be as good a mother as her own mother had been. Her mother's changed looks were a reminder to Kate of the four long years that she had been gone. She felt sad that she'd left her visit so long that they had to ask Benjamin to ask her to come and visit. Having no phone on the property made it even more difficult for Kate to keep in contact with her family. Kate had gotten quite used to using a phone as Rebecca had one in the store. Kate often used the phone to keep in touch with some of the English friends she had made over the last few years. Kate's mother, once again, held her by the shoulders and looked her up and down with a large smile spread across her full, happy face. Have you been eating? Kate laughed. Yeah, of course I've been eating. Kate's mother put her arm around her waist and guided her inside. You look like you need a good meal. Come inside, let me fix you something. No, I'm fine, really. I've just eaten. The moment Katie stepped through the door, she felt right at home. The rooms were as large as she had remembered, and the ceilings just as high. It made her little apartment seem like a small box in comparison. Her whole apartment was perhaps half the size of her bedroom at home. How long can you stay? Kate's mother was now leading her by the hand into their large dining kitchen area, where the family always congregated for meals. Kate pulled out a wooden chair and sat down. The chair had no padding on it and was rather uncomfortable, quite unlike the upholstered chairs to which she had become accustomed. Kate silently admired the handiwork of her father's handmade furniture that surrounded her. She had stepped back in time, Kate was sure of that. It was a whole different world. The pace was slower, but at the same time Kate felt that it was a little backward. She'd grown used to electricity, phones, and all the other modern conveniences. I'll stay till after dinner and then I must get back. Kate looked around the spacious kitchen. There was no microwave. Kate had a little microwave in her apartment and used it often, as she didn't have a full working kitchen where she lived. How could someone get by with no microwave? Kate smiled, as she realized that not only was there no microwave, there was no electricity for the microwave. The windows in the house were small, and as a result it was quite dark inside, even though it was bright and sunny outside. Putting the pot on for a cup of coffee at home for Kate was just the flick of a switch, but here it was much harder and took much longer. Without electricity, everything was so time-consuming and took a lot more effort. Without realizing it, Kate had grown accustomed to the conveniences of the modern world. She had thought she was so very Amish until she'd come back into the Amish world. Kate realized that she did not fit in at home, nor did she fit into the English world. Kate! Kate turned to see her younger sister Sarah rushing toward her. Kate stood up and Sarah nearly toppled her off her feet with a huge hug. Hello, Sarah. You've grown so much. Kate noticed that she was a good three inches taller and had nearly caught up to herself in height. She'd grown into a woman and was no longer the child that Kate remembered. Even the freckles across Sarah's nose were gone, and the gap between her front teeth had lessened to form a perfect set of white, straight flashing teeth. Kate realized that Sarah would be old enough now to get married, and wondered whether she'd had any offers to court. Have you come home, Kate? Kate shook her head. She didn't like disappointing her. No, I've just come to see you all. Sarah screwed up her nose. 
I wish you'd stay. Things have never been the same without you, she said. Their mother put a kettle on the gas stove. Hush, Sarah, don't burden your sister with that kind of talk. Kate was taken aback at her mother's harsh tone toward her sister. Sarah's eyes lowered to the floor. I didn't mean it that way. Sorry, Kate. Kate smiled and gave her another hug. That's okay. It's nice to have been missed. I won't stay away this long again, ever. Sarah smiled and glanced over at her mother in an I told you so kind of way. Kate hoped that her mother did not see Sarah's glance. Otherwise, Sarah would be in for another reprimand. Thankfully, she hadn't seen. Kate noticed that Annie wasn't anywhere around. Where's Annie? Annie was Kate's older sister by two years. Kate was the first of her family to go on Rumspringa. With the horses, I'd say, Sarah said. Sarah and Kate's mother laughed because Annie was always with the horses. She had a way with animals, not just horses, all animals. It was clear that Sarah and her mother had been bottling preserves as the empty bottles were spread across the large table in the kitchen. Sarah stirred something bubbling over in a large saucepan on the stove. Kate looked around and couldn't see any signs of her brother. Is Jacob playing somewhere? Kate asked. No, Jacob is helping your dad and Benjamin. Kate realized that four years was a long time if Jacob was already helping on the farm with the heavy work. He'd already started helping, like all Amish children, as soon as he could carry something without dropping it. His job before Kate left was to fetch the eggs and feed the chickens. Kate tried to ignore the mention of Benjamin's name for as long as she could, but she was aching to know how he was doing. She wanted to ask whether Benjamin was happy and whether he had any children yet. I can't wait to see Jacob. How is Dad? Kate asked. He is good, her mother replied. Kate's mother and father had always been people of few words, except when they were instructing their children in the Bible and in the ways of God. Kate wondered if her father had mellowed over time. She remembered him as strict, and he would never stand for the slightest bit of nonsense. Kate's ignoring of Benjamin didn't last long as she could not stop wondering whether he was happy with the life he had chosen, or more to the point, the wife he had chosen. He could well have two or three babies by now. Kate couldn't help herself. She had to ask about Benjamin, so she brought him into the conversation. Did you send Benjamin to ask me to visit? Chapter 5 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4.29 Yeah, he said that he would. Benjamin knew where you worked. To Kate's dismay, her mother added no extra information about Benjamin or his life. I wonder how he would know where I work. He never looks in at the tailor's store, and I've never come across him in the street. Kate was anxious for more information and prodded a little further with her questions. You still see a lot of him? Kate asked. Yeah, we see a lot of Benjamin and Lydia. Kate's mother spoke while she poured hot liquid preserves into jars, oblivious to Kate's feelings for Benjamin. Kate decided she would ask one more question, and then she would ask no more of Benjamin. Kate took a deep breath and steeled herself to ask her next question. She wasn't sure whether she wanted to know the answer. So, do they have any babies yet? Kate's mother glanced up from her bottling and looked into Kate's face. No, they do not. Kate did not dare to continue speaking. Surely her mother had known of her feelings for Benjamin. Seeing her mother and Sarah engrossed with the final stages of bottling the preserves, Kate's thoughts turned to her older sister. I will go and find Annie, Kate said. Come back soon. I want to see as much of you as possible, Sarah chirped after her. I will. Kate knew she missed her sisters terribly, but only now was she realizing that they must have missed her just as much. Kate walked toward the huge barn, which was very near the house. As she walked through the barn door, she could hear Annie speaking to one of the horses. Kate knew she was talking to her favorite black gelding. Kate walked very quietly, hoping that she would hear what Annie was saying to the horse when Annie turned and saw her. The family had three horses, but Kate knew that Stanley was Annie's special horse. She had bottle-reared him since he was born. His mother had died right after foaling him. Kate remembered that their parents had allowed Annie to sleep in the stables in those first few weeks, so it would be easier through the night with the feeds every three hours. Stanley followed Annie around everywhere she went, and he would suck on her hand trying to get a drink out of her. When he was older, Annie broke Stanley in and trained him to harness, and that special bond between them had remained. Kate! 
Annie ran to Kate and hugged her tightly. I haven't seen you for so long. Are you home for good? Please say you are. Kate knew she would have to answer a lot of questions, which had been one of the reasons she had avoided visiting her family up until now. No, just a visit this time. Annie hadn't changed at all. She was very much like their mother, whereas the rest of them were fair, resembling their father. Annie preferred to do the farm duties rather than the house duties. She loved the farm work and the outdoors and probably would have preferred to be born a man. Kate remembered how, as a child, Annie would pester their father to show her woodworking. He never showed her how to do any because he'd said it wasn't women's work. It was men's work. This had provoked Annie to tears on more than one occasion. Annie looked up and down at Kate's clothes. You are staying for dinner, aren't you? Yeah, I'm leaving after dinner. Let's sit. Annie pulled up a hay bale for both girls to sit on. Do you wear those clothes every day? Kate looked down at what she was wearing and remembered she also had the prayer cap on. No, I made some clothes to wear that are a bit English, but they don't cling to my body. They are still modest. I don't wear the prayer cap at all, Kate said. Annie pulled on one of Kate's sleeves and inspected the stitches. It's good that you can sew so well. I wish I had learned to sew, Annie told her. It's really not hard. I can show you if you like. Annie shook her head. No, it's all right. The animals keep me busy enough. You'll probably need to sew when you get married, though, Kate said. Annie laughed. I'll worry about that when the time comes. Kate was a little concerned that Annie could not sew. She was sure her mother would have taught her to sew by now. Kate hoped that Annie could at least cook or what sort of a wife would she be. I heard you found employment at a tailor? Annie asked. Yeah, we make clothes and do repairs on clothes. Sometimes we make English wedding dresses. Annie smiled broadly and pushed a few dark strands of hair back under her prayer cap. They wear big white fluffy dresses, don't they? Yes, big white fluffy dresses. They wear white to represent that they are virgins before they marry, Kate replied. That's a nice custom, Annie said. Yeah, and they wear white whether they are or not. Both of them giggled. I'm working on this wedding gown now and it's so pretty. I want to try it on when it's finished. Kate giggled. What's it like? Annie stared into Kate's face. It's all white satin with a fitted bodice. There is an underskirt with layers and layers of tulle. The fitted bodice has swirly patterns with little pearls and tiny little sparkles on it. It's so pretty. Annie nodded and smiled. Sounds lovely. Would you get married in something like that? No, I'll just try it on, Kate replied. Both sisters giggled again. Kate wondered whether her sister was happy on the farm and more importantly in the Amish community. She had thought Annie would be full of questions of what it was like to live an English lifestyle, but she hadn't really asked one question about it. Annie would much prefer to be here on the farm with the animals. Of that, Kate was certain. If Annie ever did leave, Kate thought that it wouldn't be very long before she returned to her animals. Do you ever think of leaving? Kate asked. No, I'm happy here. Besides, I could never leave my Stanley. Annie looked over at Stanley. He was a very handsome horse with a glossy, shiny coat and long mane and tail, which Annie spent a long time brushing every day. All the talk of wedding gowns made Kate think that her parents would be hoping Annie would find a suitable husband soon. Is anyone courting you, Annie? No, I do like one man, but he hasn't shown interest in me. Who is he? What's his name? Kate thought that Annie would make someone a very good wife once she learned how to sew. She had always been a good help to her mother and had always helped with her younger siblings. His name is Jesse. Annie's voice softened noticeably when she said his name. It was almost a delicate whisper. Kate thought for a while and the only Jesse she could remember was Benjamin's little brother. Benjamin's brother? Yeah. Annie smiled and put her hands to her heart. Kate had always thought of him as Benjamin's much younger little brother, yet he was the same age as Annie. Kate hoped that another one of the Yoder boys would not hurt another girl in the Miller family as Benjamin had hurt her. Kate did not know Jesse as well as she knew Benjamin. Benjamin had always come to visit them often for one reason or another. Jesse was much quieter and appeared to prefer his own company. Is he the only man you think would make a suitable husband? Annie nodded. So, do you think he likes you? Katie asked. I really can't tell. We talk quite a bit, but he talks to other girls as well. Kate could hear the familiar sounds of her brother's loud voice in the distance, so left Annie to go and meet him. Jacob immediately saw Kate at the entrance of the barn and ran toward her. 
Jacob hugged Kate very tightly. Jacob was the delight of his parents being the longed-for son after three girls. As soon as Jacob released his arms around Kate's waist, he asked, Have you come back home, Kate? Are you staying? Kate looked down at her ten-year-old chubby-cheeked brother, and it broke her heart to disappoint him. His hair was just as blonde as it had always been, and his eyes just as brown. Yet he was so much taller. Kate was reminded of how long four years really was, especially in the early years of life. She'd missed out on four long years watching her brother grow up. No, I'm here for a visit. I leave after dinner. No, no, I won't let go of you. Jacob wouldn't let go of Kate's hand and urged her to go to the creek with him to look at the tiny tadpoles that would soon turn into frogs. Kate agreed and looked up to the end of the field to see Benjamin and her father walking toward the house. Oh no, I can't speak to Benjamin again, Kate thought. Yet she could not make herself leave. Jacob tugged at her hand. Wait, Jacob, I have to see Dad, then I will come to the creek with you, Kate told him. Jacob agreed and ran on ahead of her. Kate's dad walked more briskly when he saw Kate near the barn. Kate met him in the middle of the field and her father hugged her. We've missed you, Kate. We've missed you a lot, her father said. I've missed you all too, Dad. Kate was a little surprised, as she had never remembered getting a hug from him, even as a child. She'd had the occasional hug from her mother, but could not recall the same from her dad. She knew that meant that he must have missed her very much. Were those tears misting over in his eyes? She'd never seen her father show that much emotion before. Benjamin was a little way behind Kate's father, and Kate was very much aware that soon she would have to say something to him. A moment later, Kate and Benjamin's eyes locked onto each other. Thanks for coming home, Katie. Kate's heart melted and her legs went weak underneath her. Her heart thumped so hard that she hoped no one else would be able to hear it. It was a while before she realized her father was speaking to her. What did you say, Dad? I said Benjamin and Lydia are having dinner with us, he replied. That was the last thing that Kate wanted. She only wanted to see her family who she had missed so much. She wanted a new memory to take home with her. She certainly did not need any new memories of this man, especially when she could not get the old memories of him out of her mind. Although Kate tried very hard to like Benjamin's wife, Lydia, she had the only thing that Kate had ever wanted. Benjamin. That's good. Kate forced a smile and hoped neither one of them had noticed her initial reaction. Come on, Kate. Come now. Jacob's voice echoed from behind some trees which were close to the creek. Kate called back. Jacob, why don't you go ahead of me to the creek and I will catch up with you in a little while. Jacob ran ahead to look at the frogs. Kate was not looking forward to making polite conversation with Lydia over dinner. What on earth would she say? Benjamin walked to the barn with Kate and her father. How's the farm going, Benjamin? Kate didn't really want to know about the farm. She wanted to ask more personal questions like why he and Lydia didn't have any babies. It had been over four years since they had been married. Kate could not even think of anyone Amish who did not have children, except one couple who adopted a baby after a few childless years. The farm is not doing well. It hasn't been doing well for a few years now, he said. I'm thinking of selling the farm and moving to a smaller farm or getting a job with a construction company. Kate kept silent at his startling news. His family had owned the farm next to them for generations. She knew the thought of having to sell the farm must break his heart. Kate held her peace and felt it best not to express her opinion as it may rub salt in his wounds. When they reached the barn, Kate knew Benjamin would be heading back to his own home soon to get ready to come back with Lydia for dinner. While Kate's father busied himself tidying the barn for the night and tending to the horses, Kate was alone at the barn door with Benjamin. Kate seized the opportunity to get some truthful answers to some matters that had caused Kate a lot of anguish over many years. Maybe by asking him some questions she might find some sort of closure to her painful situation. Chapter 6 God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19 Kate looked up into Benjamin's face. Benjamin, do you remember how I used to annoy you as a child? She asked. Benjamin smiled and shook his head. No, you never annoyed me. Kate laughed. I can remember following you around all the time. Benjamin looked slightly uncomfortable and shifted the weight from one foot to the other. It was never annoying, Katie. You never annoyed me. How could you? 
Kate replied. I must have annoyed you because you even said that you would marry me when I grew up. I was 14 at the time. Kate looked intently toward Benjamin. You must have said that in an effort to send me on my way or maybe to silence me. She had to know if he even remembered those careless words that had changed the course of her life. Benjamin put his hand to his mouth. I'm sorry if I said anything to give you the impression. I'm sorry for anything foolish I said to you. I'd never want to hurt you deliberately, he said. Benjamin, you said we'd be married. Kate wanted a reason, not an apology. Benjamin frowned and deep lines appeared between his eyebrows. I'm sorry, Katie. I can't properly recall. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have joked about anything so... so sacred. Kate forced a laugh. Joked? Did he say joked? Was I just a joke to him? She did not want him to see that she had carried pain for all those years. She also did not want him to know that he was the very reason and the only reason she had left the Amish. Of course I didn't take it seriously or anything, she said. Guilt ran through her body for saying something that was not true, but she could not tell her feelings to a man who was married, as that would be a far worse thing, for sure and for certain. Benjamin nodded and cast his gaze downward. The only thing Kate wanted to do now was to get out of there, but she had committed to stay for dinner. She had ordered the taxi to fetch her at 8 p.m. Kate was pleased she'd brought the subject up to Benjamin. At least now she knew the truth. The truth was that she was so unimportant to him that he did not even remember his own words to her. Or worse, he thought that it was a joke. The day he married Lydia, Kate knew that was the end of her dreams to be married to Benjamin. She knew very well that there has never been a divorce amongst the Amish. It was just not the thing that was ever done. Marriage in the Amish community was forever. Vows were made before God and they were not broken. The only hope Kate carried was that at least she might have been just a little important to him at one time. Now that last hope had disappeared, and Kate knew that she must forget this man forever. She busied herself with other thoughts while she hurried toward the creek to inspect the baby frogs with her brother. Kate saw her brother Jacob leaning over the creek with a jar in his hands. What have you got there, Jacob? she asked. Jacob did not look up from what he was doing. I found some tadpoles, he replied. Really? I'll come see. Kate leaned over Jacob's shoulder and saw hundreds of tadpoles in the little pond near the creek. Jacob put some tadpoles in a bottle. What are you doing with those, Jacob? Jacob looked up at Kate. I'm taking some home with me. Kate was concerned that they would not live if he kept them in a little bottle. Do you want to watch them grow? she asked. Yeah. Jacob held up the bottle and watched with fascination as the tadpoles wagged their little tails through the water. Kate put her hand on Jacob's shoulder. Leave them here, Jacob. They may not survive if you take them away from here. Why don't you come back and visit them every day? Jacob looked very concerned for his little tadpoles. You really think they wouldn't survive? I'll look after them carefully, he said. I think it best to leave them here where they have the right food and the right temperature and that sort of thing. You wouldn't want them to die, would you? No, that would be terrible. I will leave them here. Jacob poured the tadpoles he'd collected back into the murky pond water and smiled as he watched them wiggle away. Kate sat down on a large rock near the pond and chatted with Jacob as he watched the tadpoles. I can fish now too, you know, Jacob said. My, can you? That's very grown up. Do you catch much in the creek? Jacob's shoulders drooped down. No. There's not much here in the creek, but it's fun. There was always plenty of food at dinner. Kate had gone back to the house to help peel the vegetables. Tonight they were having roast chicken and vegetables. It was Sarah who had the job of looking after the vegetable patch, and she was very pleased with the size and the quality of her beans and marrows. Their mother's famous baked bread accompanied every evening meal. Sarah kept a sizable vegetable garden, which included sweet corn, celery, beets, carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and peas. Two apple trees and grapevines also were features of Sarah's garden. Her garden yielded large quantities of fruits and vegetables, which kept the family in food throughout all the seasons. Kate was delighted when she saw that Sarah was baking chocolate whoopie pies for dessert. Oh, Sarah, I love your whoopie pies. I've missed them. Thank you, Kate. I haven't made one in a while. I remembered you like them, so this one is especially for you. Kate smiled as she remembered that Sarah's baking specialty was whoopie pies. She made two round mound-shaped pieces of chocolate cake, with a sweet and creamy frosting sandwiched between them. 
Sometimes she would make pumpkin or gingerbread cake instead of the chocolate. But Sarah knew that chocolate was Kate's favorite. At the sound of hoofbeats, Kate went to the window and saw Benjamin and Lydia pull up in their buggy. She hurried to the front door to meet them. Just near the front door, Kate stopped to pick up one of Jacob's wooden toys. It was then that she heard Lydia's squeaky voice outside. You picked a fine time to tell me that she's here. Why didn't you tell me before we came? Lydia demanded to know. Hush, we'll have no fuss tonight. You will be polite and gracious to Kate and to our neighbors. Benjamin's tone was unusually harsh. Kate's heart skipped a beat when she heard their words. She quickly ducked back into the kitchen and waited for their knock at the door. Kate answered the door a few moments later. Benjamin, how lovely to see you. You too, Lydia. Lydia pursed her lips tightly and nodded. Thank you for having us to dinner, Kate, Benjamin said. Kate smiled and stood back to let them both in. Kate wondered why Lydia found her so objectionable. Kate's dad and Benjamin dominated the dinner conversation talking of farming. Lydia barely smiled and her face remained pale and sullen throughout dinner, so Kate's mother tried to engage Lydia in conversation. Kate thought back to the laughter and the fun they had over dinner, when just Benjamin was at their table with her family without Lydia. Kate pushed the food around on her plate as she didn't have much of an appetite but she was sure she would have room for the whoopie pies that Sarah had made especially for her. Benjamin, I've had a thought about what you said earlier about selling the farm, Kate said. Benjamin put the bread in his hand down on his plate. Yes? Instead of selling it, have you thought of selling part of it? Kate asked. A hush of silence spread over the dinner table like a heavy blanket. Lydia's eyes were fixed upon her in a very disapproving manner. Kate wondered if she'd said something extremely inappropriate. Had she been away from the Amish for so long that she was forgetting her manners? Lydia cut through the silence and laughed in a shrill, high-pitched tone, which caused Jacob to open his mouth and stare at her in astonishment. Kate ignored Lydia's laughter, and in an effort to explain herself, she continued, You know, subdividing. Lydia stopped her laughter after she realized no one was joining in with her and silence again hung in the air. Kate moved uncomfortably in her chair. It's just that I thought... It would be easier for you and Jesse to run the farm, and then you'd also get the money for selling part of the farm, and you might be able to stay on. I believe the English would call it a win-win situation, Kate said. Benjamin raised his eyebrows and slowly nodded his head. Thank you, Kate. I think that's a very good idea. What do you think, Alaya? Benjamin turned to Kate's dad. It's an idea worth seeing about. I think the Amish would call it a win-win situation, too, her father replied. Everyone at the table laughed except for Kate and Lydia. Kate's stomach was doing somersaults under Lydia's intense gaze. Thank you, Katie. Benjamin spoke softly. The sound of Benjamin calling her Katie made her heart beat faster and did little to improve her already small appetite. How she wished this dinner would be over so she could return to the safe haven of her small apartment. Kate was pleased with their approval. However, she could feel Lydia's eyes burning into her from the other side of the table. She knew the idea of hers definitely did not meet with Lydia's approval. Benjamin cleared his throat and Kate wondered if he sensed the tension rising from Lydia. Lydia wants me to sell the farm and buy a smaller house and go into a different line of work, he said. Kate covered her mouth with her hand. Ah, sorry, I didn't know. No, no, of course you would have had no way of knowing. No need to apologize. Benjamin looked at Lydia. Right, Lydia? Lydia still had her eyes on Kate. Yes, Kate, no need to apologize. You had no way of knowing. It just makes sense for Benjamin to work for my brother and his construction company. Kate considered her words to be spoken with a coldness that matched the coldness in her pale, ice-blue eyes. Kate wondered if Lydia somehow had the ability to look into the secret recesses of her heart and see the softness that lay there for her own husband. It also didn't escape Kate's notice that Lydia always spoke English to her, and not Pennsylvania Dutch. Could she be imagining it? Or was Lydia strained in her attitude toward her? Kate considered that in different circumstances, she might have felt warmer toward Lydia. But Kate's feelings for Lydia's husband made Kate keep her distance. Kate rose from her chair and began to clear everyone's plates from the dinner table in an effort to avoid anyone noticing that she'd hardly eaten anything. As if Kate's mother sensed the tension in the air, she cleverly changed the subject. Now that's enough talk of farming for now. We've got whoopie pies for dessert. Jacob clapped his hands and cheered, and everyone laughed to see such delight in his chubby face. 
Sarah and Annie helped Kate to clear the used dinner plates and brought the dessert plates and the whoopie pies to the table. Sarah proudly told everyone how she had made them. They would taste better if you put just a pinch of nutmeg in the chocolate. Nutmeg brings out the chocolate flavor so much more, Lydia said. Sarah's face turned into a frown at Lydia's comments, yet she managed to nod her head at Lydia's recommendation. Benjamin said, Sarah, I'm sure this is the best whoopie pie I ever tasted. The beaming smile returned to Sarah's face, and Lydia's face remained, as it had been throughout dinner, sullen. When the dishes were done, everyone retired to the sitting room for the Bible reading, which was a nightly tradition. When the taxi finally pulled up in front of the house a few minutes past eight, Kate had never been more pleased to see a taxi in her whole life. Kate kissed her family farewell and said goodbye to Benjamin and his wife and got in the taxi in the space of a minute. It was only 8.15 p.m. when the taxi pulled up outside Kate's little apartment above the tailor's shop. For Kate's family, bedtime was around 9 p.m., but Kate always stayed up late into the night and busied herself with quilting and sewing the little odds and ends that she sold in the local craft shop for the tourists. Kate was pleased to have the electric lights to work by rather than the gas lights of back home. Although the gas lights were adequate to read by, they gave out a different kind of light than the light of the electric ones. That night, Kate put everything out of her mind and quilted until the early hours of the morning. Kate had made many quilts since she had been there. Her quilts were popular and sold to tourists who visited Lancaster County, mostly on the very day they reached the craft store. Chapter 7 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 Kate did not get much sleep that night and woke up with the realization that she needed to go back home, back to live an Amish life. She knew it would be hard to see Benjamin, but it was something she had to do if her life was to ever be meaningful. The last four years of her life had been spent not facing reality. The reality was that Benjamin was already married to Lydia, and there was nothing she could do about it. Running away had not eased the pain, so Kate considered that she might as well go back home where she belonged. Kate had not felt bad about leaving home because her older sister Annie and younger sister Sarah were there to do the chores and tend the animals. If she had been the only child or perhaps one of only two children, she would have had a duty to stay and help out. She would miss Rebecca and the lively conversations that they had across the sewing table every day. She would even miss her minuscule apartment that she had fixed into a proper home for herself as best she could. Kate propped herself up onto one elbow in her bed and looked around at her apartment. It had already been furnished with a bed, a dressing table, two bedside tables, and a larger table and four chairs, before she moved in, and there wasn't much more furniture that would be able to fit into the small apartment. Kate made it like home by making a large quilt for her bed, much like the quilt she had at home that her grandmother had made. The building itself was over a hundred years old, as was evident in the wide floorboards that were made out of pine and lovingly polished to a high sheen. There was a small window, which opened onto the busy street below, where Kate would spend a great deal of time watching folk hurrying to and fro. The walls were wallpapered in a scroll and floral pattern, which had taken Kate some time to get used to, as the walls at her home were all plain and of pale hues. Today would be the day, Kate decided, to tell Rebecca of her plans. She knew that Rebecca would not be pleased. Just as Kate thought, Rebecca was noticeably frustrated at the news. She looked up from her sewing and pushed her thin-framed spectacles further up her nose. Kate, there are nice Englishers. If you want to get married, you don't have to go back there. I was very happily married to a man who wasn't Amish. Colin was a very good man. Kate knew that was true and had great respect for Rebecca. She knew that Colin must have been a very good man for Rebecca to love him so greatly. I know Englishers can be good people too, but I want my children to have the same upbringing I had. An Amish upbringing, Kate replied. Kate noticed Rebecca still looked unconvinced at her reasoning. I had so much fun playing in the open fields and in the barn, looking after the baby animals and helping with the chores. We all read the Bible after dinner and we grew up knowing what God wanted for us. Kate was sure Rebecca must have had a similar upbringing, so surely she would understand Kate's reasoning. Well, I don't like it. I won't be around forever, you know, and I may as well tell you now. I was fixing to leave you this place, Rebecca replied. Kate was shocked at the generosity of her good friend. That's so nice of you. 
Kate remembered that Rebecca was all alone in the world having no children. Kate was struck with regret at having to leave her. You could still work here, you know. Lots of Amish work outside nowadays, Rebecca told her. I could, but if the Lord blesses me with children, I wouldn't have time to work here as well as look after little ones. Kate felt saddened as she spoke of babies. Her reality was that she would have to have babies with someone other than Benjamin. Stay. Work here till you find yourself a husband, Rebecca suggested. The thought of staying on at the tailors and living back in the community hadn't occurred to Kate. That might be the answer. Kate thought her family might expect her to be at home all the time helping with the chores, but they would be so happy that she had come home that they would be prepared to overlook her having employment in town with an Englisher. A customer entered the store and interrupted their conversation. Kate looked up from her sewing machine and looked over briefly to see a tall Amish man, about Rebecca's age, standing at the counter. He was holding an article of dark-colored clothing in his hands. After he left, Rebecca did not return to the sewing table immediately, but instead tended to bookwork. Rebecca finally sat down opposite Kate. Who was he? Kate asked. Rebecca didn't look up. Who? You know very well who I'm talking about. That tall, dark, mysterious Amish man who was just in here. A little smile tugged at the corners of Rebecca's lips. He's been in before with some small sewing jobs. He's a widower. Kate noticed that there was a new light across Rebecca's face that she had never seen before. Ah, convenient. Kate smiled, and Rebecca shook her head at her friend's comment. Kate wondered how Rebecca would know such a thing about him. It was very unusual for Amish to come into the store because they always tended to their own sewing. Even a widower would turn his hand to needle and thread if he had the need. Kate studied her friend's face. You like him, don't you? Kate asked. Rebecca laughed. Of course not. He's just a customer, she replied. I saw you take off your glasses and smooth down your hair before you approached him, Kate said. Rebecca couldn't suppress her smile. He seems very nice. That's all I'm saying. He might bring a flower in for you next time. Kate laughed at her own comment and was pleased that her friend looked so happy. Kate had a feeling that the Amish stranger may have found Rebecca to be a very pleasant woman since that wasn't his first visit to the shop. Maybe this man knew Rebecca from years ago. An old beau, perhaps? Kate thought back to their early conversation before the tall, mysterious Amish man had interrupted them. All right, I will stay on here after I return home. I think that would be great. Thank you. Kate was pleased she would not have to leave Rebecca. Rebecca nodded her head and continued smiling. Good. I'm glad. Kate looked around the small store, pleased that she would be staying on. Even though she liked the calmness of the wide-open fields of home, she had grown fond of the lively hustle and bustle of the little street where she worked and lived. She certainly would miss the convenience of electricity and the phone, the small television in Kate's room, which she left on to have some background noise when the apartment was too quiet. She never really followed any of the television shows. Now she could have a little piece of both worlds. She wasn't quite ready to get baptized yet, and she hoped people in the community, and especially the bishop, would not try to pressure her into it. Kate, it's Liz on the phone. Kate had been so engrossed in her own thoughts that she hadn't even noticed that the phone had rung. Liz and Kate had grown up together, and they'd left the community around the same time. Liz was living with an Englishman, Peter, and vowed she would never go back to the Amish. She'd cut her hair short and wore clothes that revealed her curves, and had turned very much against the Amish ways. Hi, Liz. Come to dinner tonight, Kate. I'll pick you up, Liz asked. Kate accepted the dinner invitation, knowing that it may be the last time that she could openly socialize with her friend who was now English. I'd love that. Kate used to spend weekends with her friend Liz, until Liz moved in with the Englisher. Kate did not feel right about staying overnight with a couple who were living together and were not married. Kate showered and got ready for her friend Liz to pick her up. Liz lived about ten minutes' drive away from Kate's apartment. Kate left off her scarf and tied her hair back on her head. She wore the most English dress she had in her closet, which was extremely plain. Like all her clothes she had made herself, it wasn't fitted close to her figure, but neither was it as loose as the normal Amish clothing. Kate waited outside the shop at one minute before the arranged time. She knew that the only reliable thing about Liz was her obsessiveness to always be on time for everything. One minute later, she saw Liz's familiar red car. Hi, jump in, Liz said. 
Kate opened the car door and got inside. The girls kissed each other. Kate noticed that Liz was wearing jeans. Liz rarely wore anything apart from jeans and brief tops that clung to her curves. Peter's working tonight, so I'm taking you out to dinner at a restaurant. Is that all right? Normally they ate at Liz's home. Kate had been to restaurants before, but she didn't like to go out much because people stared at her clothing when she was dressed Amish. Often they would stop her and ask questions about what it's like to be Amish, and more often than not, they wanted to take photos. Yeah, I mean, yes. Kate was conscious not to speak too much Pennsylvanian Dutch to her friend who was trying to live the life of an Englisher. I booked us into a Mexican restaurant, Liz said. Oh good, I love Mexican food. Kate often got takeaway Mexican food for her dinner. Kate wondered if there would be a good moment for her to tell Liz of her plans of going back to the Amish. They sat in one of the booths in the Mexican restaurant. Kate was pleased that the long bench seats were soft and comfortable. The Mexican atmosphere was reinforced with the music and the colorful large paintings that hung on the walls. Kate was glad that she'd left off her scarf and had dressed in such a way that she would not draw too much attention to herself. Kate, look over there. Isn't that Ephraim? Kate looked across to the other side of the room and saw that Ephraim was eating with an English girl. Yes, it certainly is. Liz kept staring over at Ephraim, who was engrossed in a conversation with the girl in front of him. He looks very handsome. He'd be nearly worth going back for, Liz said. Kate laughed. Now that Liz had brought up the subject of going back, Kate took the opportunity to tell Liz of her plans. Liz, now you mention going back. Liz dropped the menu from her hands. Are you going back? Kate nodded and was sure she was going to get a stern reprimand from her friend. However, Liz said nothing and looked into the distance. Kate was desperate to know what her best friend would think of her sudden decision to return after four years. Well, aren't you going to tell me not to go? Liz picked up her menu again and began looking at it while she spoke. No, you haven't exactly embraced the English lifestyle, have you? I suppose not, but you know why I left, don't you? Kate asked. Please don't talk about Benjamin again. I've always told you there are more fish in the sea and he's not all that. Look at Ephraim over there. He had a huge crush on you years ago. Probably still has, Liz replied. Kate looked over at Ephraim as Liz continued talking. He's good looking too, just as good looking as Benjamin or maybe a bit more. Kate thought that Ephraim was indeed good looking. Ephraim was as tall as Benjamin and had dark hair and even darker eyes. The outside of a person didn't matter much to Kate as she wanted kindness, gentleness, and honesty in a man. She also wanted a man who would love being a dad. The waitress came to take their order, and after that Liz was silent for a moment before she spoke. I'll miss you, Kate. I'll miss you as well. Kate hoped her friend would eventually come back to the Amish at some point in time. They had so much fun together when they were young, and Kate had assumed that they would have babies at the same time, and their children would grow up together just as they had. Kate put her thoughts into words. I always thought we'd get married at the same time and have babies. Liz smiled. I remember we always used to talk about having babies together. I will have babies someday. Not too soon, though, maybe when I'm 30 or something. The meals arrived quite quickly, and while they were in the middle of their meal, they saw Ephraim leave with the English girl. I'm glad he didn't see us. Kate didn't want to be seen by Ephraim as she wasn't wearing the proper Amish clothing. Even though technically she was on Rumspringa, she still thought that Ephraim might be a potential husband. Chapter 8 Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark eleven twenty four. It had been months since Kate had gone back to live with her Amish family in the Amish community. She'd adjusted to helping with the chores and working for Rebecca at the tailor's shop. Mostly the chores at home were cooking and cleaning, and at night she sewed. She missed the bright lights that the electricity provided. She could not sew for as long as it was too much strain on her eyes. Kate was pleased to have the company of her family, and she spent as much time as she could with Jacob. Kate had reacquainted with her old friend Ephraim at a wedding. Ephraim had grown up with Kate, and Kate always thought that if she didn't marry Benjamin, then the next logical choice would be Ephraim. Now that Kate had grown up, she still thought that Ephraim might make a good husband, but was still tormented with thoughts of Benjamin. Kate never had any feelings in her heart for Ephraim the way she had feelings in her heart for Benjamin. Ephraim had never made her tummy flutter or her heart race. 
He was kind and hardworking, and that, Kate thought, would make for a good husband. You going to the barn raising tomorrow, Kate? Annie asked. Ephraim's family's barn had burned down, and the whole community was turning out to help rebuild it. Kate knew that she would have to get up before dawn to start work. It was the women's duty to help keep the food supplied to the men who were working hard at the barn raising. They would be there till very late in the day. Yeah, I'd be glad to go. Ephraim would be at the barn raising. Kate had already decided that the next time Ephraim asked her on a buggy ride, she'd go. However, she did not want to give Ephraim the impression that she was interested in him until she knew whether he was the one that God wanted for her. There aren't as many barn raisings as there used to be, Annie said. Really, why not? It's the price of the land. A lot of the Amish are moving away from farming, Annie told her. Kate already knew that a lot of the Amish were moving away from farming. When she was a child, it seemed the Amish were all farmers. Now many Amish had set up construction businesses and even hired Englishers. In fact, many had jobs outside of the community. Kate wondered if time was going to blend the Amish into the English community. That's a bit sad. Kate really liked the way the Amish stuck together and always helped each other, just like one big family. The whole community would come together at the barn raisings, showing how much they cared and supported one another. Very different from the English, Kate thought. Kate noted that a lot of the Englishers live isolated lives. I suppose it's progress, though, isn't it? Annie said. Kate nodded. Ephraim said that the foundations are already there from the old barn, so it should be completed fairly quickly, Annie said. From attending a lot of barn raisings as a child, Kate knew that due to the hundreds of men helping, the wooden frame would go up fairly quickly, and the whole thing from start to finish would generally take a week. When did you see Ephraim? Kate asked. Annie smiled. No, Kate, I don't care for Ephraim. Besides, I think he's always had a soft spot for you. Kate laughed. You know me too well, Annie. Kate wanted to find out what Annie thought about Ephraim, because she didn't want to think about liking him, if there was any chance that Annie liked him as well. Ephraim was a good man, and may have made a good match for Annie if things with Jesse didn't work out. Will Jesse be at the barn raising? I guess he will. Annie giggled. Kate hoped that Annie's dreams of Jesse showing her attention would come true. She had seen the two of them together many a time and thought that Jesse may be interested, but he had not made a move. He had not asked her on a buggy ride or taken the opportunity to speak with her in private. Kate thought it a good sign that Jesse had not shown any interest in any other girl either. It was Annie, Jacob, Kate, and their dad going to the barn raising. Annie and Kate would help to keep the men properly fed. Even though Jacob was very young, there were a lot of jobs that children were able to help with. The men were all over the roof hammering nails in. They look like a lot of ants building a nest, Kate thought. She took a closer look at the men and was sure she spied Ephraim on the roof. The sight of Ephraim made her hope he would ask her on another buggy ride, and this time she would say yes. The barn raising went by, and although Ephraim had been very busy, he did talk to her, but there was no mention made of any buggy ride. I guess he's fully focused on the job, Kate thought. After all, it is his parents' barn. Kate knew that she must be patient and wait until the timing was right. They arrived home very late that night. There had been plenty of food at the barn raising, so they certainly didn't need any dinner that night. Kate flopped on her bed, exhausted after such a busy day, and fell into a dreamy, half-asleep state. While she was half-asleep, a thought that came out of nowhere occurred to her. The thought was that if Lydia happened to die, that would leave Benjamin free to marry. She wished for a split second that Lydia would die. That would be the answer, for her to be able to marry Benjamin. At once, Kate pushed that thought from her mind. Kate was shocked that she would have such a thought, even for a fleeting moment. She asked God to forgive her. How could I have thought such a wicked thing? She remembered the scripture in the Bible, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Kate hardly slept that night, and woke up in the morning ready to go to the gathering together as it was the second Sunday. The meeting was to be held at a neighbor's house. The family enjoyed a simple breakfast of cereal as they chatted happily together about the barn raising of the previous day. Jacob was eating very quickly. Can I have seconds? he asked. Sarah laughed. 
You can as long as you finish everything on your plate. You're going to grow up to be a fine, strapping man if you keep eating like that, Kate's dad told him. They were disturbed by a loud knock on the door. When Kate's father opened the door, one of the ministers nearly fell through it. His face was as white as a sheet. I'm afraid I have some terrible news, he blurted. Kate's father quickly sent Jacob upstairs and sat the minister down at the breakfast table. Go on, Kate's father urged him. It's Lydia. She has gone to be with the Lord. Kate felt her heart freeze. She was sure for a moment it had stopped beating. She heard her mother gasp. After a moment, Katie heard her mother's words as if from afar. What happened? She was perfectly healthy. Kate looked at everyone's faces. Annie was looking down into her lap. Sarah had tears running down her cheeks and her parents both looked stunned. She had epilepsy. Jesse told me about a bad seizure she had a couple weeks ago, Annie said. The minister nodded. The doctor said that she smothered in the night while having a very bad epileptic seizure. That's horrid, Sarah said while fighting back tears. Annie patted Sarah's shoulder and everyone was silent for a time. Kate was struck with horror. Could my bad thoughts have been the cause of her death? Chapter 9 Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Psalms 1 1 A year later Kate was satisfied that she could have Benjamin's company, along with his younger brother Jesse, regularly at the family dinner table and afterwards at the family Bible readings. Kate knew that her sister Annie was most pleased that Jesse was a more regular visitor to the house as well. It was obvious that Annie liked Jesse. She would fuss over him and keep asking him if he had enough to eat, and she would make sure to sit near him as often as she could. Kate could not tell from Jesse's reactions if Annie's feelings were returned. She hoped in time that they would be, otherwise her sister Annie would be destined to the same pain that she had gone through for the past six years. Kate had put all thoughts and desires of Benjamin out of her heart. I don't deserve to be happy, and I certainly didn't deserve a good man like Benjamin, Kate thought. Kate had waited a long time for Ephraim to ask her on a buggy ride. Saturday afternoon was the time Ephraim had arranged to pick her up, a few days away. All right, I think enough time has passed for me to say something, Rebecca said as she put her sewing down and looked at Kate. Kate knew from the look on Rebecca's face and how she positioned her glasses on her nose, that she had something very important to say. Yeah? It's been over a year since Benjamin's wife went to be with the Lord. So is there anything happening with you and Benjamin? Rebecca asked. Kate drew in her breath sharply. No, that part of my life is finished. What are you saying? Don't you want a house, husband and children? Rebecca said. Kate nodded. Yeah, if the Lord sees fit to give them to me. If he doesn't, then it won't happen. Kate thought about Ephraim and wondered if she had been too hasty to dismiss him as a potential husband. After all, she couldn't expect to feel the same way toward anyone as she had toward Benjamin. You're not fooling me. You can pretend all you like, but I still see the way you look at him when he goes past every week, Rebecca said. A pang went through Kate's heart, and she had nothing to say in response. She pursed her lips tightly, hung her head, and continued sewing. Rebecca muttered something under her breath that Kate couldn't quite hear. Kate was concerned for herself and worried over her own thoughts. She was still haunted by the fleeting moment she had wished Lydia dead. I'm not worthy of happiness because I am selfish. Kate was too nervous to tell Rebecca that Benjamin had already asked to court her, and she had turned him down. She knew Rebecca would reprimand her severely, and then she would not let up talking about it. Rebecca, I am trusting in God to bring me a husband, and it won't be Benjamin. It also won't be Ephraim, she thought. Kate hoped that Rebecca wouldn't reply. Rebecca shook her head. You've wanted him for so long and now he's available. What's stopping you? Kate looked up at Rebecca. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Ever. Kate knew what Rebecca said was right. She had loved Benjamin since she could remember. He felt like part of her family already. She would like nothing more on earth than to be married to Benjamin. But she'd ruined everything. Kate's thoughts turned to Ephraim. Two weeks ago, Ephraim had let her know that he was interested in her. Kate was a little pleased that he was still interested after she'd rejected his initial interest. There's someone else I like. The words had escaped from Kate's mouth as a way of avoiding more talk of her beloved Benjamin. Rebecca shook her head. 
No, I don't think there is. Try and talk yourself into it all you like, but Benjamin is the only one you have eyes for. Kate cast her eyes downward. There was no fooling Rebecca. Kate was not going to give up her diversion tactics that easily. His name's Ephraim, and he's a good man. Rebecca looked a little surprised and continued working without saying a word. Saturday afternoon had come very quickly, and Kate was having second thoughts about accepting Ephraim's offer. Kate's tummy was doing somersaults as she saw Ephraim's buggy pull up in front of her house. There was something telling her that she'd made a big mistake. It was too late to back out now. And besides, Ephraim was already waiting for her. Kate took her black shawl and wrapped it around her shoulders, as the evening was getting a little cool. She felt a little better when she saw Ephraim's kind, happy face. He helped her up into the gray buggy and she noticed that there was a blanket on the back seat. Kate wondered if he'd placed it there, especially for the buggy ride in case she got cold. If that was the case, Kate considered it was a very thoughtful thing to do. We'll just go a little way up here. He drove up a narrow ribbon of road behind his farm. Kate wasn't familiar with that particular road or the area in which they were driving. Kate thought the trees were so pretty. The countryside is really pretty, she said. Ephraim took his attention from the road to glance at Kate quickly. Not as pretty as the view I'm looking at right now. Kate dropped her head and felt her cheeks get hot. It was the first time an Amish person had referred to her looks. Ephraim turned his attention back to the road. Do you want to stop and walk a little way? He asked. That would be nice. Walking might ease my queasy tummy. Kate looked at Ephraim as he helped her out of the buggy and wondered if she would ever be able to have this man as her husband. He seemed kind, but he did not affect her heart in the way that Benjamin had. As they walked up a narrow road to a field, Ephraim gestured widely with his hand. This is all my land, he said. Kate knew that he wasn't saying that in a proud or boastful manner. He was telling her that as a potential wife. It's beautiful, she replied. Ephraim took hold of Kate's hand. Kate was shocked by his boldness and wanted to pull her hand from his, but she kept it still. She knew she had to give him a chance, and this was one way that she could show God that she was trying to forget Benjamin. When Ephraim saw that Kate had not resisted the holding of her hand, he pulled her sharply to him and their lips nearly met. Kate was caught off balance, steadied herself, then snatched her hand back from him. Ephraim, what are you doing? she asked. Ephraim laughed. Just trying to give you a little kiss, that's all. Kate angrily stomped her foot on the ground. Ephraim Zook, you will not steal a kiss from me. Ephraim's smiling face turned to one of anger. There's nothing wrong with a kiss. What's wrong with you? He asked. Kate felt a little fearful of his anger, yet she stuck to her morals. You tried to steal a kiss. You did not ask me and we are not courting. That's what's wrong with it, Ephraim. Kate fumed and snapped her next words. There is nothing wrong with me. Kate was outraged. She was saving that first kiss for her husband. The only man she wanted to kiss was her future husband, and she had not decided before now whether it would be Ephraim or not. From his actions, Kate decided that Ephraim would not be her husband. Take me back home at once. Kate walked briskly back to the buggy, not waiting for a reply. The ten-minute ride back to Kate's house was spent in uncomfortable silence. His attitude was not kind, nor was it understanding, and Kate wanted both of those qualities in a husband. As soon as they reached Kate's house, Ephraim said, There's nothing wrong with a kiss, Kate. It's just a kiss. Kate got out of the buggy and shut the buggy door. Good day to you, Ephraim. Without acknowledging anyone in the house, Kate walked in and went straight up the stairs to her bedroom. She threw her prayer cap to the floor and flung herself on her bed and cried bitterly. Ephraim had been her best hope of getting over Benjamin, and now that hope had gone. Kate cheered herself up with the thought that she didn't have to choose anyone. She was still young and had plenty of time for the right man to show. Besides, she knew from her recent experience with Ephraim that having no man was better than having the wrong man. Kate thought of the few women she knew that found a husband when they were in their thirties, and they had not suffered by finding a husband later in life. Kate, are you all right? Kate heard Annie's voice from outside the door and sat up on the bed. You can come in. Annie opened the door. Whatever is the matter? Kate wiped tears from her eyes with her hand. Ephraim tried to kiss me. Annie walked over to Kate and stood by her bed. You don't like him? Annie flopped back down on Kate's bed. No, not now. Annie stroked Kate's hair. I've heard some talk of him that he may not be honorable. 
Kate sat up. I wish you'd told me. No, these things are best to find out for yourself. I'm not one to tattle behind people's backs. I feel a little better now. Thank you, Annie. The sisters hugged. Anyway, I'm the oldest, so I have to get married before you. Annie laughed and playfully poked her sister in the ribs. I'm waiting till Jesse notices me. He will notice you, Annie, he will, Kate told her. Kate was pleased that her sister was soft on Jesse and not his brother, Benjamin. Annie, I always thought I might marry Ephraim, and now that I don't think he's suitable, I feel there is no one else for me. Although Kate was close with Annie, she'd never really discussed boys or potential suitors with her in any depth before. Annie shook her head. From the time you were little, it was always you and Benjamin. I was sure you'd grow up and marry him, Annie said. Kate fixed a smile on her face and pursed her lips. So was I. It just didn't happen. You still can. He likes you, Kate. I think maybe he even loves you. Kate raised her eyebrows and looked at her sister. Annie continued. Everyone knows he likes you and everyone knows you like him. Kate remained silent and wondered who everyone was. Her family? Kate yawned. I'm tired now, Annie. I need some sleep. Annie stood up and walked to the door. Just before she walked out, she turned and said in a teasing manner, You still could, you know. Kate sat up in bed. Still could what? Still could marry Benjamin. He needs a wife. I'm tired and I don't want to talk about him. Kate threw a pillow at her sister, but it missed and hit the door. Kate could hear Annie's giggles behind the closed door. As Kate forced herself to get off the bed to change into her nightgown, she wondered why she felt in such a hurry to be married. She wished she could be more like Annie who seemed happy and content with her life just the way it is. Annie was just happy looking after the horses and the other animals while waiting for Jesse to notice her. Kate suspected that if Jesse never noticed Annie, she would not care a toss. I don't want to be too old before I have children. A life without children was not a life that appealed to Kate at all. Kate called to mind the scripture about not having any cares about anything. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Of course, Ephraim was unaware of the fact that he had always been Kate's backstop man. From her youth, Ephraim had been the man she thought she might marry if she, for some reason, did not marry Benjamin. Now she knew she would not marry a man like Ephraim, and all hopes of Benjamin had gone as well. Chapter 10 Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Psalm 71, 3 See you this afternoon, then. Kate waved as Annie drove off in the buggy after she'd dropped her to the tailor's store. Kate was grateful that Annie loved to give Stanley the exercise of dropping her to work in the morning and picking her up in the evening. Just as Kate was about to walk into the store, she felt a hand on her shoulder. Benjamin, she exclaimed. Hello, Katie. Kate immediately felt her heart speed up to quite a pace. What are you doing in town so early? She asked. Benjamin stood quite straight and rigid as if he was nervous. I have a job in town that should last all day. Kate smiled knowing that he needed all the work he could get since the farm was struggling financially. That's good, she replied. The corners of Benjamin's mouth turned slightly upwards and his kind eyes flickered. I was wondering if you might join me for lunch, he asked. Kate's heart pounded in her chest at his words. How could she have lunch with this man if her heart pounded like this in his presence? Well, I don't really have a lunch break. You could have come up with a better answer, Kate. Benjamin relaxed and laughed a little. Surely you have to eat. Do you want me to speak to your boss? Kate smiled and was stuck for an answer. No, she definitely did not want him to speak to Rebecca, and she was hoping that Rebecca was not inside looking at them both right now. It was hard. No, it was impossible to say no to this man. Kate nodded. All right then, I will have lunch with you. Good, I will come and collect you at 12.30. Kate watched him walk away then turned the door handle and entered the shop. Benjamin? Rebecca asked. Rebecca was sitting at her workstation in full view of what had just taken place between Kate and Benjamin. Oh no, don't start, please. Kate stowed her belongings in the side cupboard. You've got to tell me what just happened. Looked pretty interesting between you two. 
I could feel the heat from here. Rebecca picked up a notebook close by and fanned herself. Phew. All right. He asked me to have lunch with him. That's all. Rebecca put the notebook down and looked very serious. I hope you said yes. Yeah, I said yes. Good. Kate's heart had returned to the normal rate, yet her stomach was in knots. Why does he want to have lunch with me? Is he interested in me? If he's interested in me, why didn't he ask me on a buggy ride? Why lunch? A multitude of questions were swirling in Kate's head. What if he's not interested in me and wants to talk about something else? His farm, maybe? Benjamin had taken Kate's suggestion of subdividing and had sold a very small portion of his farm. Kate only knew that because she had seen a handsome small house that had been built on the very edge of his farm. He also started to take the odd carpentry job here and there to supplement the farm income, while Jesse stayed and worked the farm. Kate heard the tinkle of the bell that hung over the door and looked up expecting to see a customer. It was Benjamin. She glanced to the other wall where the clock hung. It was 12.30 p.m. already. Benjamin and Rebecca smiled and nodded their hellos to each other. Be there in a sec, Kate called out. Kate finished off the long seam she was sewing and switched her machine off. Be back soon, Rebecca, Kate said. Take your time, Rebecca said. Kate wished Rebecca hadn't said take your time. She had planned to say that they were very busy so she could leave lunch early. Benjamin opened the front door for Kate, and they both walked into the sunlight. Oh, it's such a beautiful day, she said as the sun warmed her skin. It surely is. Come this way. Benjamin led her to his buggy with a gentle hand under her elbow. Kate assumed they would have lunch at one of the little restaurants or coffee shops in town. I've made us lunch, but we have a ten-minute ride to get there. Kate smiled and was flattered that he'd obviously gone to quite a bit of effort. Could he be interested in me as a wife? Kate dismissed her thoughts. She remembered that the option of being his wife had disappeared a long time ago. Once they were well on their way, Kate asked, Where are we going? Benjamin's eyes were glued to the road as a truck sped past them, missing them by only inches. It's a bit of a surprise. Kate knew that the road they were on was one of the ways to get to Benjamin's farm. He turned the buggy down a little side road where Kate could see the new house that had gone up on the portion of land that Benjamin had sold. They pulled up in front of the new house. We are having lunch here, Benjamin said. Kate said nothing and wondered who owned the house. There was no garden around the house, and it looked as though it was totally unlived in. Does anyone live here yet? Not yet. We're having lunch on the porch. Benjamin led Kate to the porch where there were two large wooden chairs and a table. You sit here and I will bring the lunch out. Are we allowed to do this? Benjamin didn't answer her. Kate sat down and tried to work out why Benjamin was going into a house that belonged to someone else. Why does he have a key? Maybe they have entrusted him as caretaker until they move in. Benjamin brought back a large tray with a pitcher of iced tea and cold meat and relish sandwiches. All Kate's nerves had settled and curiosity had taken over. Thank you. Kate realized she was hungry when she saw the food. She reached forward and took a sandwich. Benjamin settled himself in the chair on the opposite side of the table. It's such a beautiful house, Benjamin. Who is going to move in? Do I know them? Benjamin finished his mouthful of sandwich. Katie, I built this home for us. Kate dropped the sandwich she was holding and it fell to the porch floor. What? Katie, I may be too bold. I don't know, but I must say this. I have loved you for a long time. I put all that love into this house as I was too scared that you may not feel the same. Benjamin turned his eyes to the house. Now the house is finished and I must speak my mind. Kate stood up. You can't just build a house. You haven't even asked to court me. It's madness. Benjamin stood up and stepped in front of her. No. The only madness is that I never stuck to my word and married you when I had the chance. Something I've regretted for the longest time. Kate gasped at his words. Was it possible he did mean those words he spoke to me when I was 14? Kate looked up into his familiar, kind eyes. His eyes locked onto hers. Kate felt like the rest of the world did not exist. They were the only two alive. Benjamin put a hand lightly around Kate's back and lowered his lips toward hers. Kate closed her eyes. She had been sorry that she did not know the taste of those lips for so long, and now she was going to feel his lips on hers. At last. No. At the last moment, Kate pulled away and pushed him back with both hands against his hard chest. Katie, what's wrong? 
Kate stepped back. No, Benjamin, I can't marry you. Why? He searched her face for an answer. Is it Ephraim? Kate was secretly pleased when she realized that he was jealous of Ephraim. Please tell me it's not Ephraim, of all people. Kate shook her head. No, it's not because of Ephraim. Do you love me, Katie? Benjamin closed the distance between them. Kate took a deep breath. She could not say out loud that she did not love him. Of course she loved him, and he must have known it. She loved him with everything in her being. Benjamin, I can't answer that question right now. You can't just build a house without telling me and just spring this surprise upon me. We haven't courted or anything. Kate took a step back from him. Benjamin's eyes turned to the ground, and Kate's heart was struck with regret. She realized that he could have sold this land to someone else, but instead he built this for her with his own two hands and she sounded so ungrateful. You're right, but I feel we've been together for a lifetime, Benjamin said. We haven't, though. You were married to Lydia. There, she'd said it, Lydia. Benjamin drew a deep breath in and sat down. That's it then, isn't it? It's my marrying Lydia that's the problem. Kate said, I suppose so. Now I must get back to work. Katie, I can't change what has happened in the past. Believe me, if I could, I surely would. Let me explain what happened and how I came to marry Lydia. I'm sure you had good reasons, Benjamin, but I really do have to get back to work so Rebecca can have some lunch as well. The buggy ride back to the tailor shop was spent in silence. What possible reason could he have for marrying Lydia? I certainly don't want to hear that he loved her more than me. Building a house without asking me or courting me? Ridiculous. They said their goodbyes politely, and Kate opened the door of the shop to see Rebecca's tall, mysterious Amish man engrossed in a conversation with her. Kate knew by the look on Rebecca's face that she really was very fond of this man. When the Amish man left, Rebecca sat down and asked Kate how her date went. Don't you have to have lunch or something, Rebecca? I had a sandwich out the back before Jeremiah came in, she replied. Kate nodded. She didn't have the strength to tease Rebecca about her new love interest, Jeremiah. Rebecca, he built me a house. Rebecca tilted her head to the side. Who built you a house? Benjamin built me a house. Rebecca frowned. What do you mean a house? A toy house? A doll's house? She asked. No, a real live house on the other side of his farm. It must have cost him a lot of money, and I thought that he'd sold the land to someone, and they built a house on it. Rebecca gasped and put her hand to her mouth. Oh my. He wants to marry you? Kate nodded and smiled at how ridiculous the whole thing sounded. Yeah, but I couldn't say yes, I just couldn't. I was in shock. Kate was expecting a reprimand from Rebecca. But instead, Rebecca remained silent. Aren't you going to say something? Like, tell me what to do? Kate was going from one emotion to another. She was pleased that he loved her, yet sad that she could not say yes to him. She turned the machine on and got ready to start where she'd left off before she'd gone to lunch. Rebecca always numbered the jobs that she was to work on, and they were put on a shelf to one side of the room. The next job that Kate had to do was repair a tear in a pair of men's black trousers. Kate wondered if they were Jeremiah's, the Amish man who had just been in the shop who seemed interested in Rebecca. Rebecca shook her head. No, you have to figure things out for yourself. Kate assumed from Rebecca's body language that she thought Kate should have known what to do. While Kate was figuring out how best to mend the trousers in front of her, she thought back to the conversation she had just had with Benjamin. He said he'd always loved her. Why did he marry Lydia, though? It didn't make sense. Maybe she should have let him tell her and shouldn't have let fear get the better of her. She could not keep her news inside any longer. He wanted to tell me why he married Lydia. Rebecca stopped what she was doing and looked up. Did I hear you rightly? He was going to tell you why he married Lydia? Yeah, I wouldn't let him tell me. I was too scared of the reason, Kate replied. Maybe you should find out why he married her. At least then you would know the truth and it may put your mind at rest. As usual, Rebecca was right. She should have let him say why he married Lydia. He wanted to tell her so she should have listened. Kate started worrying that she'd made a mess of things by not hearing him out. But what possible reason could he have for marrying Lydia, apart from being in love with her? Could there possibly be another reason that Benjamin married Lydia? Kate couldn't think of one possible explanation that would satisfy her that Benjamin would marry a person other than herself. Rebecca broke through the rapid thoughts that were cascading through Kate's mind. All right, I have to say something. 
Rebecca looked over her glasses at Kate. Kate knew that she had something important to say to her. Go on. This is what you have been complaining about ever since I've known you. You stare out the window every Tuesday just to catch a glimpse of the man. He finally asks you to marry him and you hesitate? Rebecca just stared at Kate. Kate nodded. Well, I don't understand you at all, Kate. You should have just said yes and be done with it. Or do you only want what you can't have? Kate was surprised by the sharp tone in Rebecca's voice. No, no, it's nothing like that. I still feel the same about him. It's just that a lot of things have happened. Like he married Lydia. Rebecca remained silent and put her attention back into her sewing. Kate knew that Lydia was the thing she could not let go of, and the fact that Benjamin had chosen Lydia over herself. Could she ever get over the pain of the past that still haunted her? It wasn't only the fact that Benjamin had married Lydia. It was that awful moment the day before Lydia had died that she had wished that she would die. That was something too horrible to share with anyone, even Rebecca. It was too awful to speak out aloud. The rest of the day, Rebecca hardly spoke to Kate at all, which was most out of character. Kate figured she could hardly blame her after all the talk she'd listened to over the years about Benjamin. Of course, Rebecca would never be able to understand why she hesitated to say yes to Benjamin. Annie came to pick Kate up from work as usual and sensed that there was something wrong. Are you all right, Kate? Just a bit of tension today with the deadlines for the sewing, that's all. The buggy ride home and Annie's chatting on the way helped rid Kate of some of the tension that was soaring through her body. After dinner that night, as Kate was helping with the dishes, she heard a knock on the front door. Since she was the closest, she opened the door to see Benjamin standing in front of her. Her heart skipped a little, as it always did when she saw him. Hello, Katie. Would you come on a buggy ride with me? I have a few things I'd like to speak with you about. I'll just let them know I'm going. Kate let her dad know where she was going, and she noticed a flicker of a smile on his face. She knew her dad and mother would love it if she married Benjamin. Benjamin pulled off the road a little way from the house and stopped. Katie, I must tell you the reason I married Lydia, and you need to listen to me. This was the moment Kate was dreading, yet at the same time she really wanted to know the reason. All right then, Benjamin, tell me. Years ago I went to see the bishop with some questions I had about marrying you. Nothing personal, they were just general questions about the process of marriage. Benjamin took a deep breath. You did? About marrying me? She asked. Benjamin nodded. On the way there I saw Lydia crying while walking in the direction of the bishop's house. I asked her what had upset her. She couldn't speak at first, but finally admitted that she had been forced to have relations with a man, and now she was expecting his child and she did not know what to do. I impulsively said that I would marry her. Something that I have regretted every single day since. Kate remained silent, feeling sorry for Lydia, and also for Benjamin. She knew Benjamin was a very honorable man, but this was something that could have been handled in a very different way. However, Benjamin was probably thinking how awkward it would be for a single mother bringing up a child in the Amish community. She would have had to leave, and what would have become of the poor little baby? Do you know who the man was? She asked. Yeah. I spoke to him and said I would expose his behavior if I suspected anything of him again. Benjamin slowly shook his head. He said he was sorry and promised he would never do anything like that again. I don't know if he confessed his sins to the bishop or not. Kate knew by the way he was speaking that he did not want to identify the man. So he was Amish? Benjamin nodded. I'm sorry, Katie. It's only now that I can tell you something like this. Kate wondered what became of the baby as they had no children. The baby, Benjamin sighed. Lydia miscarried weeks after we married. You never had more babies, she said. It wasn't a normal marriage. It was never consummated, he said. If we lived alone, we would have had separate rooms, but since Jesse lived with us, we had to settle for separate beds. So it would at least look like a normal marriage. Kate gasped and put her hand up to her mouth. Benjamin and Lydia had never been intimate. Benjamin could have lived his whole life in a cold, childless marriage. That must have been awful for you, Benjamin. Kate was a little ashamed of herself because she was secretly very pleased by the news. We were civil to each other, but we never agreed on anything. The awful thing was seeing you and not being able to marry you or have babies with you, and I could never tell you why. Not while I was married to Lydia, he said. Kate smiled. Her Benjamin had been in love with her for all these years, just as she had been in love with him. 
peace flooded through her heart, but was short-lived when she remembered how she'd wished Lydia dead. I don't expect you to forgive me. I just hope you will forgive me someday, Benjamin said. I do forgive you, Benjamin. A tender smile spread across Benjamin's face. Will you allow me to court you? Kate shook her head and tears came to her eyes. No, it's complicated now. It's just complicated. No, Katie, it's not complicated. I've just told you why I married Lydia. We don't have to live in the house I built if you prefer to live somewhere else, he said. Kate looked up at him and had no words. How could she tell this wonderful, honorable, godly man that she had wished his wife dead? It's not the house. It's perfect. Then what is it, Katie? I'll do anything. Just tell me what will make you happy. Unfortunately, there was nothing he could do to remedy the situation. Just take me home. A tear trickled down her cheek, and she turned aside so Benjamin would not be able to see it. Benjamin nodded and turned the buggy toward home. As Benjamin helped Katie out of the buggy, he smiled and looked down into her eyes. I've waited a long time for you so I can wait longer. A little smile crossed Kate's lips as she walked toward her house. That night, Kate could not sleep. She was angry and wished that he had not been so impulsive to say that he would marry Lydia. It hadn't just ruined his life. It had ruined hers as well. Lydia should have told the bishop, and it would have been on the man's head, whoever he was. Has that man got away with his behavior? Lydia wouldn't have got in trouble if she were forced to have relations with him against her will. Maybe she had put herself in a vulnerable situation. But all would have been forgiven if she had been truly sorry. Kate berated herself because she was in no position to judge anyone after her own evil thoughts. Besides, how horrid it would be to raise a baby without a husband. Chapter 11 The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum 1, 3 As Annie hitched the buggy to the horse, Kate decided that she would be on her best behavior at work and not mention Benjamin at all. She would work hard, quickly, and have a smile on her face all day. As Kate pushed the door of the store open, she heard the familiar tinkle of the bell above the door. Rebecca was sitting in her usual place at the end of the long wooden table that was their sewing table. Something was different. Rebecca was different. Kate walked to the back room to put her lunch away. Rebecca, what's different? She asked. Rebecca's face was beaming. Jeremiah asked me to come see his farm on Saturday. Oh, that's wonderful. So you really like him then? Kate noticed that Rebecca looked years younger and her face glowed. Rebecca slowly nodded her head. Yeah, I do. Could you go back to the community? Kate asked. Yeah, I'd probably have to confess my wicked ways and explain myself to the bishop. I guess I could do that. Kate laughed. You would do that? My life would hardly be different from the life I lead now, would it? I'd still keep my business and I'd most likely rent my house out. Rebecca caught herself and laughed. Here I am already reorganizing my life, and I've only been asked to come out and see his farm. Despite her comments, Rebecca looked off into the distance, as if she was dreaming of a future life with Jeremiah. But that means a lot, Rebecca. He's single and obviously wants a wife, I'd say. What if he wants you to stay home and cook and clean? Rebecca shook her head at Kate. Kate, stop being such a negative Nelly. We're both getting ahead of ourselves. Kate and Rebecca laughed. Does he have any children? Kate asked. Yeah, he has two boys who left the Amish years ago. They still come to see him from time to time. Kate thought how hard it would be to have children and have them all leave the community. Then she realized that her parents must have been very glad to see her return. Now let's have no more men talk today, Rebecca said. Okay, Kate agreed. Phone for you, Kate. Kate guessed rightly that it would be Liz on the phone because they hadn't spoken for some time and she rarely got calls from anyone else. Kate, can I come and stay with you and your family for a week or so? Liz asked. Of course you can. Why? What's happened? I just haven't been getting on with Peter. Long story short, I'm at the hospital now because he hit me in the face. Kate gasped. He what? Hit me in the face. That's why I can't go home. All my money was in his name, so now I have nothing. Do you want Annie to come and fetch you? I still have my car. I'll be okay to drive. Liz had always been the one in control, always the one that knew what to do in every situation. 
Okay, I'll have Benjamin or Jesse get a message to Dad and Mom that you'll be coming. You can stay in my room. Thank you so much, Kate. I don't know what I'd do without you. To hear her friend so broken down filled Kate with uneasiness. As soon as Kate hung up the phone to Liz, she called Benjamin's house. She hoped that someone would be in their barn to answer the phone quickly. As with all Amish, their community members never have a phone in a house but have them outside, mostly in their barns, or a special covering made just for the phone. Kate's dad still refused to have a phone, not even in his barn. As luck would have it, Jesse answered the phone and said he would deliver the message straight away. Kate knew that her parents wouldn't mind to have Liz under their roof. They knew Liz really well being a close childhood friend of Kate's. Liz's parents had disowned her when she left the Amish and began living with her English boyfriend. There was no way she could go back to them. Where's Liz? Kate asked. Kate's mother turned around from the kitchen sink where she was peeling vegetables for the evening dinner. She's in your room. She's only been here for about an hour. Looks as if she's in a bad way. Thanks for having her here, Kate said. You know that any of your friends are always welcome here. Kate wasn't so sure if they'd be so welcoming if they knew Liz's own family had shunned her. Her family aren't talking to her. I thought as much. That's something we can talk to Liz's parents about at a later time. They can't stop us having her here, and I don't think the bishop would get involved. She hasn't been shunned. No, she won't be here very long anyway, Kate said. Kate's mother nodded. Kate was shocked when she walked through her bedroom door to see Liz's face half covered with a large white covering. It's not as bad as it looks. Liz lifted one corner of the bandage to reveal red bruises with some open abrasions. Kate shrugged her shoulders and sat on the bed next to Liz. Must have given you a fright. Liz stuck the bandage back down onto her face. No, not really. He's threatened to hit me before. He's even lost his temper and punched holes in the walls of the house we rented. Kate was a little taken aback that Liz had never mentioned that Peter, her boyfriend, was prone to violence. He had always seemed so nice and polite. That's horrible. Why didn't you leave before? Love, I guess. Tears started to well up in Liz's eyes. Also, I had nowhere to go. I couldn't go back home. I don't want to be Amish. The girls were silent for a while. I don't know what I'm going to do. Liz fought back tears. Kate put her hand on Liz's shoulder. Don't worry. You can stay here as long as you like till you figure things out. Liz was visibly relieved. Thank you. I've put in an application for a job. I hear in about two weeks if I get it. Other than that, I don't really know what to do. Do you want to eat dinner up here or do you want to come down and eat? Liz took a deep breath and sat up straight. I'm okay to come down and eat, thanks. I might go and check my cell phone. I left it in the car. Kate suddenly remembered that Benjamin and Jesse were coming for dinner that night. We have guests for dinner, Benjamin and Jesse. Liz smiled. Oh, good. I haven't seen them in a while. Throughout dinner, it was obvious that Jesse's attention was focused on Liz. His eyes had been glued to her voluptuous curves that were revealed by the clingy English clothes she was wearing. It was clear to Kate that Benjamin had noticed his brother's behavior as she saw that he'd given him a quick kick under the table in an effort to tell him to divert his eyes. Maybe she should have suggested that Liz wear something a little less provocative for dinner, even borrowed something of hers. Not that it was provocative by English standards, but it was by Amish standards. Kate's eyes darted toward Annie to see if she had noticed all the attention that Jesse was giving to Liz. Thankfully, Annie didn't appear to notice. Everyone apart from Jacob was respectful of Liz's privacy and didn't ask her any personal questions. Jacob asked Liz why she had the bandage on her face, and Liz told him that she had fallen down the stairs and landed on her face. Kate was grateful to have Liz's company at dinner because it made things a little less awkward between Benjamin and herself. If Liz hadn't been there, Kate was sure he would have sought a private moment with her. He may have even asked her on a buggy ride, and that was something that she was not ready for. Liz's lively personality wasn't dampened by her situation, and the conversation at dinner flowed easily. Mostly, the conversation centered on when they were younger and the fun they'd had growing up in the community. Kate wondered if it weren't nerves speaking as Liz was a little more animated and lively than she normally was. After dinner, Kate and her sisters cleared the table while the rest of them got ready for the customary Bible reading. Kate's dad suggested to Liz that she needn't join them if she felt uncomfortable or would rather do something else. Liz thanked him and went up to Kate's room. Kate wished that Liz stayed downstairs as she had been acting as a buffer between herself and Benjamin. 
Now that Liz was gone, she was sure that Benjamin would want to speak with her in private. However, the night ended without Benjamin making the slightest effort to speak with her. An entire week passed and Benjamin and Jesse were having dinner again at Kate's house. During the week, Kate had been filled with regret at denying her love for Benjamin. She asked God to give her a second chance with Benjamin. Kate sent up a silent prayer of thanks when after dinner Benjamin asked if he could speak to Kate outside, alone. They stood on the porch in the cool summer breeze. Kate, I know you said that you don't want to marry me, but can I at least know why? I'd make a good husband, he said. Kate looked down at the boards under her feet and kicked the boards slightly with her boots. It's just that I can't. Kate knew that was a weak answer and it wasn't even a reason. Kate, you once asked me if I remembered saying to you that I would marry you when you grew up, he started. Kate looked up into Benjamin's handsome face. Yeah? I'm sorry, Kate, he said. Sorry? Kate wondered what he would be sorry about. I'm sorry I lied to you when I said I did not remember, because I did remember. I told you I didn't remember because I was married to Lydia at the time. If I told you I remembered, I would have had to tell you a whole lot more, he said. Kate raised her eyebrows and was gladdened in her heart that he did remember his promise to her when she was younger. He continued. Ephraim told me some years ago that you kissed him and promised to wed him, he said. Kate opened her mouth in horror. I never said such a thing to Ephraim, or did such a thing. I have never kissed a man, she told him. I know that now. The thought of you kissing another man was most likely a factor in my hasty decision to marry Lydia when I saw her in great distress and in need of a husband. Kate wanted to cry and had to fight the tears, which were trying to escape her eyes. Lydia was a good woman, but we were unsuited and I've already told you the rest. Kate nodded as she remembered him saying that they'd never been intimate and they'd only married because Lydia was with child by another man. Kate remained silent, knowing that Benjamin had more that he wanted to say. Katie, it was wrong of me, I know, but you never left my heart. It was wrong of me being married to Lydia and to feel love and softness in my heart for you. A tear trickled down Kate's face. I can't. I don't deserve you, she said. Benjamin put one finger under Kate's chin and lifted it toward him. What do you mean, Katie? he asked. Kate knew she must finally tell him how wicked she had been. I need to ask your forgiveness. Benjamin raised his eyebrows slightly and stepped in a little closer to her. Yeah? I wished in my heart for a moment that Lydia would die so I could have you to be mine. Kate swallowed hard and cast her eyes downward as she couldn't look into Benjamin's face. Then she died. Kate had struggled to get all those words out, and as she did, tears flowed down her cheeks. Benjamin smiled a little. Katie, it is not your fault that she died. Don't feel badly. It is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. Kate looked into Benjamin's dark hazel eyes, and he continued his quote, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. She replied. Kate nodded and was comforted by God's words. She knew that all people were sinners and that's why everyone needed God. Katie, I forgive you and God forgives you. Now you need to forgive yourself, he told her. Kate and Benjamin looked into each other's eyes. If you can forgive me, then I forgive myself, Kate said. I will ask you again because I can wait no longer. Katie, will you do me the honor of being my wife? He asked. Kate's heart pounded as Benjamin softly wiped away the tears from her cheeks with one finger. Yes, Benjamin, that's all I've ever wanted. Benjamin dropped his fingers from Kate's cheeks and took her hand in his, and they gently interlocked fingers. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22, 23. You have been listening to A Simple Choice, Amish Romance Secrets, Book One, written by Samantha Price, narrated by Susanna Coleman, copyright 2023 by Samantha Price, production copyright 2023 by Samantha Price.